Today we're helping a couple of newlyweds who hope to kick off their married life in a new home with dreams of running a B&B. &B. What about this for your guests, then? I don't know. I would quite like it for myself. <laughs> <laughs> but one of our properties leaves them lost for words. My goodness. I don't know what to say. Well, today we are on the Welsh borders, and these are the beautiful surroundings of Hawkston Park Follies in Shropshire. They are widely regarded as perhaps one of the best examples of the English landscape garden dating back to the 18th century. They contain a fantastic mix of caves, cliffs, follies and woodland. What sets this place apart is that it bucked the trend of the day for more classical, symmetrical gardens and instead embraced and imitated nature. It was restored 20 years ago and now visitors revel in its surroundings. From up here, you can see right across the border to the mountains of Wales on a clear day. The land straddling the length of the border between England and Wales is traditionally known as the Welsh Marches and includes parts of Powys on the Welsh side and Shropshire in England. This northern section of the Marches is a region of enduring beauty, characterised by classic unspoilt hilly countryside and striking field patterns. The borderlands were fiercely contested for hundreds of years and contain the highest concentration of modern Bailey castles in the country. Chirk Castle, a magnificent medieval fortress completed in the 14th century, is a particularly fine example. On the English side, the historic town of Ludlow in Shropshire is a renowned gastro hotspot, home to a whole host of eateries and cafes. So with its mix of scenery and historic architecture, the Welsh borders is an escapee's paradise, and somewhere it really is possible to get away from it all. As well as stunning countryside, property prices here are also very attractive. In Shropshire, the average cost of a detached property is currently £245,000. That's 32000 below the national figure. And it gets even better if you head further west, over the border into Wales and Powys. There, the same sort of thing could cost you £80,000 less. So, time now to beat today's buyers and find out which side of the border they want to be on. Steve and Ali, who live near the town of Devizes in Wiltshire, met each other through an online dating site just 18 months ago. A whirlwind romance led to a speedy proposal, and they've been married for just a month. So now they want to kick-start this next exciting chapter in a new country home. Steve proposed to me when we went to Sri Lanka last year. It was towards the end of the holiday. Walked out onto the beach with her in the evening, held her in my arms and said, would you marry me? We both lost our partners some years ago. We're now looking to create a life together rather than staying in the jobs that we've currently got. Steve works in IT and Ali in sales, but the highly pressured corporate world has taken its toll on Steve. I commute almost uh, three hours, three and a half hours a day. So our escape is more than just escaping into uh, a more rural environment. It's escaping from that whole uh, work environment. Steve and Ali both have two grown-up children from their previous relationships, but they've left home and the couple currently live in a four-bedroom property that Steve bought before meeting Ali. I chose this house when I was single that the children could come home to. Since we met, it's obvious that the house doesn't meet our requirements. We'd like to choose somewhere which is ours. And they've chosen the Welsh border country for their first shared home together. It's a lovely area, it's isn't beautiful, it? beautiful, beautiful area. Mm -hmm. And fortunately, it's still within the price bracket that uh, we have. But Steve and Ali don't just want a new home. A joint business venture is in the pipeline. When we were courting, we both, I said to you, I'd like to uh, own a bed and breakfast. And you said, <laughs> that's what I'd like to do, didn't exactly. you? Exactly. We want to get to a point where we can retire and just look after the the B and B and some letting units and have a life. And when they're not busy with the B and B, they should have more time for their passions, which include baking and cake making for Ali. Whereas Steve hopes his modelling will take off. I took up flying model aircraft about eight years ago, just as something to really de-stress with. It's become a bit of an obsession. I've got something like 25 aircraft. It gives me a great pleasure picking one of those up, taking that up onto the hill and throwing it off. But their rural dream isn't just a flight of fancy. 
They're under no illusions that this is a big move, though it is a chance for the newlyweds to spend some quality time with each other. I'm well aware that running a B&B isn't going to be without its stresses and uh, without its early mornings. But it's doing something that we both enjoy. Absolutely. Steve and Ali want to find a property in the northern section of the English-Welsh border, but don't mind which country they live in. So we'll be looking both in Shropshire and Wales for their new home. I'm meeting up with them in Shropshire to learn more about their planned move. Well, Stephen, Alison, welcome to Escape to the Country. This is all quite exciting. Am I right in saying that you only got married six weeks ago? We did. So, Alison, what are you hoping to achieve with this move? We are hoping to um, open a bed and breakfast with some letting units. We want about three bedrooms and three letting units, both of us giving up our... Uh, full-time jobs. Have you ever done anything like it before? I have. I've run pubs and restaurants, but you haven't, have you seen? No, I haven't. Why have you settled on the northern end of, of the Welsh borders? We like this area, uh, the countryside, the hills, there's some lovely country houses. We feel that there's um, a lot to draw people to this area. What would your ideal home look like? Perhaps an old farmhouse, um, a rectory. Perhaps a barn that needs converting or some outbuildings that we could um, turn into letting units. How much of a project would you take on? If we started off with three rooms that we could let, that would give us enough income to start with. And then if there were uh, barn conversion, stable conversion or something like that, we, we would do over time. And also perhaps a little bit of land as well. Ah, <laughs> what's going to happen on that? <laughs> well, Some animals? Yes, yes. yes. I, I, Ideally, like some pasture and also woodland. You really are painting a picture of the ideal country life. I mean, you know, this is all very good. It is going to be hard work as well, though. It really is. Yeah. B&Bs are not an easy wicket. How are you going to make your business that little bit different to all of the others to get that trade? Um, I think we're going to go for luxury b and yeah. We are aiming at the luxury yeah. end. Yeah. So, Alison, how much are you planning to spend on all this? Uh, 750,000. Three quarters of a million, Steve. That's right, yes. It's, it's a lot of money. It's scary, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> but this is an area where I think you can get very good value for money. We've got some really interesting properties to show you. I hope they will inspire you uh, to create a vision of what this business uh, could look like. Shall we go? Absolutely, let's right, do it. Drink up. With a budget of £750,000, Steve and Ali are after a traditional older property with character. In an ideal world, they'd like a five-bedroom house that would allow them to let out three rooms as bed and breakfast units, but with the potential to develop up to three self-catering holiday lets around it. Steve would like some land to fulfil his smallholding ambitions, and a bonus would be some private woodland in their grounds. We've lined up a selection of classic border country contenders for our house-hunting newlyweds to consider. But the honeymoon might be over when I reveal the price at the end of the property tours. And of course, we've got a mystery house that might well challenge Stephen and Ali on age, but it does give them more than they bargained for elsewhere. Our first offering is situated in the popular Welsh market town of Llangollen. An ancient Welsh settlement situated on the banks of the River Dee, it takes its name from its founding 7th century saint. Today it's a thriving tourist centre and probably best known for hosting the international musical I Stedford every summer, which attracts over 100,000 people. Located within walking distance of Clangothlan, our first house is set in a quiet, elevated position overlooking the town. Well, we crossed the border into Wales. There we are, guys. Oh, wow. This is different. I don't know what to say. It's lovely. It's certainly going to be big enough where it looks like it is from here. The garden looks nice. That lot there is a six-bedroom property, five of which are en suite. Fantastic. Mm. The current owners have lived here 30-odd years, and they have run it as a B&B in the past, hence the en suite bedrooms. Yeah, yeah. And to the left, that building there is also with it, and that is a two-bedroom cottage. My goodness. That's incredible. Let's see what you think. There's okay. plenty to see. There's a lot to take in at this handsome Tudor-style Victorian residence, with its separate two-bedroom holiday let set in a separate coach house, which earns around £8,000 a year. Unfortunately, the let has guests staying in it at the moment, so I can't show it to Steve and Ali. 
But the main house, which has its entrance around the corner, should keep us busy. What do you think of this then, Alison? Oh, that's lovely. That's beautiful, isn't it? Isn't it? What a nicely proportioned room. The whole room itself could act as a guest wing, if you like, because it opens up into this. Have a look at this end. Um, <laughs> Oh. So you've got sort of guest sitting room. Come on over, come on over. <laughs> this is the best view, I think, oh, from here. Oh, that's lovely. Because you can see all of that yeah. and all of this. Yeah. What a beautiful house. What about this for your guests, then? I don't know. I would quite like it for myself. <laughs> <laughs> I thought so. <laughs> Ali needn't worry. Her and Steve's accommodation is pretty good as well. A door from the guest dining room leads onto another equally impressive reception room. There, this is what we think would be your bit. Oh, wow. <laughs> open nice. mouth and open eye, Alison. That's nice. That's lovely. Yeah. That's plenty big enough for us, us as a yeah. living room. Yeah. Right, come and have a look at the kitchen. Okay. You'll like this. Yeah. Dying to see the kitchen. Oh, that's a nice kitchen. That's lovely. I think you could spoil your guests. I do. Through that door is a huge utility room. Come laundry room, I would suggest, and another little storage area too. And also, you've got a cellar here as well. Seriously? Yeah. If you're into oh. your wine, trust me. Oh, yeah. yeah, here you go, Luke. <laughs> you've got a wine cellar too. There's currently a quarter size snooker table in there at the minute, like a pool right. table. Okay. So actually, that's how big it is. It's lovely, absolutely lovely. Now, I did say to you on the outside that we had uh, six bedrooms to explore. Yes. Upstairs might take a little bit of time. <laughs> Come and have a look. Not surprisingly, our buyers like the space they get with this substantial property, and the ground floor room arrangement gives them privacy from their guests. Of the six bedrooms in the property, five are on the first floor. They're all generous, and four of those have ensuite bath or shower rooms. There's also a family bathroom you could easily get lost in. And up on the second floor, there's an attic games room, but I'm showing Steve and Ali the largest bedroom on the first floor, which I've earmarked as their master. Wow. This is yours, although, to be perfectly honest, any one of those ensuite bedrooms would pass as a very comfortable master bedroom. I wow. love the ceiling. This is lovely. Absolutely amazing. Now, you're going to like this. Huge proportions. His and hers storage. You're kidding. Nope. No, it's his, hers and his. <laughs> or hers, probably. Well, you can take your pick. <laughs> Bags of built-in storage with this one. Uh, and a really nice, the proportioned ensuite. Uh, ensuite through there, as okay. you would expect. Yeah. I think it's... Yeah, it's still raining. Should we brave it? Yes. I think so. Let's have a quick look at the garden. Come on. The sixth bedroom is back downstairs as part of a small separate annex arrangement. It comes with an ensuite bathroom, as well as lounge and kitchenette, and provides excellent self-catering letting opportunities, currently bringing in around £4,000 a year. Outside, extensive landscape gardens fan out from the back of the property with a lovely backdrop of the Berwyn Hills and Dinasbrand Castle, which today is shrouded in misty rain. Ah, well, it's raining a bit more than I thought. <laughs> Can you admire the garden from here? I think so, yes. Uh, it is about two acres all in. How much is it going to cost you? Because this could be the slightly tricky bit. You go first. Uh, I think it's right at the top end of our budget, mm -hmm. the 750. 750,000 pounds, three quarter of a million, says your brand new husband. And I was going to say that. You can agree. No. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it, it works well. That's a, that's a good <laughs> omen for the future, isn't it? OK. Um, I'm going to go uh, 775. This could be yours for £650,000. Seriously? Really? Gosh. That's amazing. 100000 left over to make any little tweaks that you would want to. Gracious. Can That's... I buy it? <laughs> <laughs> I'd love you to buy it. Lovely property. <laughs> well, look, go and explore. Rediscover this property. Try and work out the ground plan. Try and cement it into your minds, because there's a lot to take on with this one, and I will catch you later on somewhere. Off you go. Thanks. £100,000 below budget, the price of our Tudor-style mansion comes as a pleasant surprise, as it leaves Stephen Alley some of their budget to put their stamp on it. Offering separate accommodation from their guests, there are six bedrooms in the main house. 
One of those six is part of an annex joining the main property, and there's also a separate two-bedroom coach house across the driveway, unlocking bags of business potential. The land, seen from where we saw it, looks stunning. So very, very impressed with this property. I really, really like it. It's got everything that we wanted. Lovely large kitchen with a range. There's six bedrooms, five with ensuite, so we would be able to let them, all of them, if we wanted to. Hey, how are we doing? Very well. Thanks. Yeah? Am I standing outside your new home? I hope so. <laughs> <laughs> well, you can certainly afford it. And wow, what an exciting proposition. Yeah. Absolutely um, stunning property. Steve and Ali have asked that their new property include some private woodland. They're keen on using wood from their land for fuel. But more than half of the UK's small woodlands are in decline. Over the last 20 years, one third have disappeared due to poor management and countryside development. Smallwoods is an organisation designed to maintain and protect the 400,000 hectares of smallwoods in the UK. To find out more about sustainable woodland management, they're meeting Chief Executive Mike Bentley. What size of woodland should we be looking at to uh, have something which is sustainable and would uh, help us with the heating? For, for self-supply yes, of wood fuel? Yes. Um, you don't actually need that large an area, um, quite surprisingly. About one hectare of mixed broadleaf woodland, you would be able to produce a, a sustainable yield of, say, four cubic metres or four tonnes of firewood per year, mm. which would normally be enough to heat a wood fuel stove in a medium-sized cottage. Assuming that we do get some woodland, what type of trees should we be looking for? I would probably advise you to go for a um, woodland with mixed species. Right. Um, there are a couple of nasty pests and diseases going around at the moment, mm. um, particularly affecting ash. You've obviously heard of ash dieback. Yes, yes, yes. you've seen it in our area. And also there's a fungus that's affecting larch trees. So a woodland that was purely larch or purely ash may be one to avoid. The most traditional method of woodland management is coppicing, the ancient practice of cutting a tree off at its stump to encourage rapid regrowth of buds and shoots. Opening up the tree canopy to let in light also promotes greater biodiversity. The extra light reaching the ground encourages wildflowers and plants, attracting butterflies and other insects. As well as benefiting the ecosystem, coppicing has an added advantage. You're left with freshly cut wood from which you can create useful everyday objects. The practice known as green woodworking also employs traditional handmade tools. Steve is going to try his hand at making a spatula and Ali a rolling pin using freshly felled ash. Again, through the middle there. OK. And stick it in the brace. So leave it, hey, whoa, good. Well it done. went. <laughs> it did. Well done. Meanwhile, Ali is shaping her rolling pin using an age-old shave horse and a draw knife to create a rounded cylindrical shape by continually turning the object. It looks really dangerous, I know, but it, in fact, it's not really. I mean, it, it, it's really hard to actually bring the knife far enough back to cause you any damage. So okay. just, just keep going, uh, keep turning it, and okay. I'll come back and see how okay. you get on. All right, Thank okay. You. Steve has now drawn the outline of a spatula onto his piece of wood and begins shaping the utensil with a side axe. Yeah, you still got your fingers then? Yep. Absolutely, all five. Good, good, good. Hey, actually, that's looking good. He then joins Ali on the shave horse to smooth off the edges. So what we're going to try and do is reduce it down even more now. OK. OK, using the uh, draw knife. If want, yeah, if you want to know what to do, just ask her. She's an expert now. <laughs> OK, so... Uh, but here you go. Have a go. OK. So, nice, strong... There we go. It's quite satisfying, isn't it? It's, yeah. Uh, yeah. Ali's rolling pin is also gradually taking shape. The final step for Steve is to round off the spatula with a knife. Hey, first attempt, I think you should be proud of that. Very good. How about you? What's the rolling pin like coming along? <laughs> I think a few more hours. A few know? more hours yeah, needed. I think so. It's more round than when we started. Yeah. Well, guys, you've done really well. It's your first attempt. It looks, they look fantastic. Thank you. Yeah, no, you. you should be really proud of it. Yeah, it's so. been really enjoyable. Yes, Good, yeah. that's the Thank main you thing. Very much. Okay. Well, Steve and Ali now have some handy tips on managing woodland and working with green wood. As the day draws to a close, it's a chance for them to reflect on the property hunt so far. 
It's the second day of our B&B property search along the English-Welsh border with newlywed Steve and Ali from Wiltshire. With their £750,000 budget, we're hoping to find them a property that separates their home from their guests. Coming up, our mystery house pulls out all the stops for the business. I think people would be stunned when they came in here. And I meet the men of steel whose artwork could save lives on our streets. Well, short autumn days mean some pretty early starts here on Escape to the Country, and we've got plenty to fit in on our final day of house hunting. Now, yesterday, I thought went really well. That house in Clangotlan, I think, offered Stephen and Alison a brilliant opportunity. And if we showed them nothing else, well, maybe our work would be done. But, of course, we have got more to see. But building on the theme of yesterday, we're going to head back into Wales to try and find them yet more value for money. And, of course, it's Mystery House Day. For our next offering, we're venturing deeper into Mid Wales, to the hamlets of Penros. This is classic border country, rolling fields crisscrossed by lines of hedgerows, with hillside vistas stretching far into the distance. The nearest neighbour to our next house is a pretty church, and these spiritual connections are a clue to the property's former life. But will it enlighten our buyers? Oh, you're joking. Look at this. <laughs> Oh. Come this way, Alison. Chickens. Chickens. We'll keep those. <laughs> nice bit of planting, lovely views yes. of mid Wales. Oh. And there, what is it? It's a rectory. It's a rectory, <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> it's the sort of thing that I think is the archetypal country home. Set within its own plot, as this one is. Lovely mature gardens, about a couple of acres here. That's gorgeous. Uh, it's been renovated extensively over the last 11 years or so by the current owners. Young family, and they've given it a really fun contemporary twist inside. But as you would expect, it's pretty cavernous, with an interesting range of outbuildings too, which could be developed further into more holiday okay. let potential. That's what we're thinking. Lovely. Come on. Built in the late 19th century, the former vicarage has been remodelled by the current owners who've given an old building a stylishly modern twist. Oh, gosh. Isn't this fun? <laughs> Someone's had some great fun decorating this. Wow. <laughs> you see what I mean? It's quite contemporary. It is, isn't it? Uh, the red floor is pretty bold, but you've got the traditional fireplace, which is lovely. These gorgeous windows, they're original, as are the shutters. Rather cleverly, they've removed the walls either side of this fireplace to let the whole thing flow around it. Have a look at this. So removing this wall was a really good idea, I think. And again, it gets you into... Oh, this is nice. This. Lovely. Yeah, this is a lovely room. Nice. Yeah. It's quite an original rethinking of a very traditional building. As a guest suite of rooms, if you like, for dining and relaxing... Plenty of room. ..works a treat. Yeah. And it gives you that division between the dining end and something else. Come and have a look at the kitchen. Thank you. The striking decor of the old rectory has made its mark on Steve and Ali. To the rear of the house, there's also a spacious office, somewhere to run the business from. But next, we're appraising the kitchen. There. Oh, wow. That's great, isn't it? That's a lovely catering kitchen. It certainly has that industrial, utilitarian feel to it. All the stainless steel. That is really good. I actually like the stainless steel kitchen. Yeah. Alison? I like the range. I like the taps. <laughs> I like the window looking out onto that beautiful view. Yeah. And it opens up around here to give you your own dining end, I suppose, or kind of living room if you wanted it. Oh, gosh, what a huge room. Well, quite a lot of walls have been removed to create yes. this effect. There's another door to the right which leads back into the hallway, and next door to that, a door to a very, very extensive cellar, which is pretty much original. I could imagine having a sofa in that part of the room there. Yeah, that yeah, would be a nice yeah, sort yeah. of relaxation. We could actually there, have that as ours, couldn't yes. we? Um, you could have this whole bit. Yes, exactly. So now we've cleverly divided up the ground floor, we need to turn our attention to the sleeping arrangements. Upstairs, there are five bedrooms, including a venerable master suite with high ceiling and a stylish ensuite wet room. There are three other bedrooms on the first floor, including two big guest doubles, a smaller single and a large family bathroom. There's a further bedroom on the top floor of the roof space, serviced by its own bathroom, ideal for B&B &B guests. But I want to show Steve and Ali my plan for their self-catering holiday visitors. An outbuilding at the back, which could be converted into at least one letting unit. There. <laughs> Currently used as a studio, formerly a chicken shed. 
A large area, though. It's really good. Those double doors go out to a pretty elaborate greenhouse come garden room come conservatory, mm. which would make a great addition to a holiday let if you were able and minded to, um, to do something with this. But, of course, it's all going to come down to price. It is. Because <laughs> you are going to have to spend some money on this one. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah agreed. Right, come on, let's go out to the garden. The house and outbuildings sit in two acres of private grounds with a mainly lawned, well-established garden. Lovely view, isn't it? Beautiful, absolutely beautiful. Looking south there, over towards the rest of Mid Wales, as we get to the difficult bit, which, of course, is the price. What's it on the market for, madam? 6.40. Oh, no hesitation there, <laughs> 6.40, OK. I'd go 6.20. 6.20. A bit of optimism is creeping into your <laughs> price guesses. And I don't blame you for being optimistic. This was on the market for £750,000. But the exciting thing is that it has been reduced to £650,000. So you weren't oh. far off. It's, it's got real potential at that price. <laughs> well, look, guys, go and have a look around. In particular, have a look upstairs. Think about those B&B bedrooms uh, for now. And I will come and find you a little bit later on. We did. OK, thank Please. you. Enjoy. Under budget by £100,000, this former rectory has been beautifully converted to create a contemporary family home. The open plan reception room gives our buyers a space to accommodate bed and breakfast guests and there are at least three letting bedrooms in the main house. There's also potential and money left over to develop a letting unit in a separate outbuilding. I was really excited to see that it was an old rectory. The five bedrooms, I'm not sure whether we would be able to use it as a bed and breakfast, but perhaps we would be able to use some of the outbuildings for the letting purpose. As far as the location of this house, it's brilliant. Great views, fantastic grounds, couldn't ask for more. Looking at it from a business point of view, it doesn't instantly match our requirements for bed and breakfast and for the letting units without some development work. Are you tempted? I think I could be. It's certainly an option, yes, yes. I think you should be. But we have one more to come. Mystery House is coming up soon. Come on. For our final choice, we're heading deeper into Wales to the small town of Llanvaer Cyrenion. Perched on the banks of the River Banwy, the charming town has a peaceful feel with a distinctive architectural style, hosting a range of shops and pubs. Nestled into the south-facing hills around a mile from the town is our mystery house. Now, Steve and Ali wanted some land. Our mystery house has it in spades, but our buyers also wanted a traditional home. And although this one has a classic Welsh pedigree, inside it's much more contemporary. You may this well part. chuckle, because <laughs> this is our mystery house. <laughs> Come over here and take it all in. It's really unusual, isn't it? Effectively, in the middle was a small, traditional cottage. It's then been extended either side, initially in the 1990s, over here, to create something which is, I guess, a bit more traditional. And then in 2005, this entire wing was added, which, as you can probably tell, has a much more contemporary feel it has five stroke six bedrooms right. on offer. Right. Uh, it has two staircases. That's very good. So what we're thinking is owner's wing mm -hmm. over here and B&B wing over there. Over here. OK. You also get that huge barn up there. Oh, we <laughs> thought that was another house. No, nope. <laughs> that's all yours. Belonging to somebody else. The whole lot sits within, wait for it, 19 acres. <laughs> Oh. <laughs> <laughs> and those acres go behind the property up onto the hill. Mm -hmm. Lovely amount of woodland, which I know is of interest to you. Right. And then it extends below us here. So where do we start with this enormous property? We have one front door, of course. We could either go left and look at the owner's accommodation, or we could go right and look at the B&B. &B. What do you want to do? Yeah. I think the b business B &B, side. Yeah. 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 Let's do the business end first, and then we will spoil you with your bit. Come on. Okay. The original stone longhouse dates to the 18th century, but the addition of the two extensions has more than doubled the property's size, giving Stephen Alley lots of options for paying guests. And the 19 acres of land gives them bags of room for a luxury camping business. Now imagine a door there separating you 
from this. This would be guest accommodation. What a beautiful oh, room. Yes. Original wow. fireplace there. Yeah, loads and loads of character. Loads, but come on this way. Very funky staircase. <laughs> but, oh, that's lovely. Now this, anywhere else, would be a fabulous family living room. But this, because of the two wings, could be your guest sitting room. And a luxury one at that, absolutely. I don't know what to say. <laughs> it's so nice. Come and have a look next door, because this is really, really interesting. Now, they've got this set up as a kind of hobby craft room. Oh, I love the red. Have in your minds that this could be given over to a guest kitchen, which would mean the main kitchen would be just for you. Right, which is what we wanted, really. We just need to put in a slightly larger kitchen, exactly. stove... And... Let's have a look at a guest master, if you like. Okay. Come and see this. Our mystery package is drawing our buyers in, and they've yet to see their own wing of this place. Upstairs in the contemporary guest quarters, there are two decent-sized bedrooms, which are both served by a sizeable shower room. Now, I'm thinking you could market this as a premium suite for your guests. What a beautiful room. Huge, isn't it? Fantastic views. Yeah. Fantastic views from it. I think people would be stunned when they came in here. Let's have a look at your yeah. bit. Let's start with the kitchen. Come and look okay. at this. The main house can be accessed either from the upstairs landing or through a small boot room on the ground floor and gives our buyers the separation they wanted from the business. Now, this sort of boot room comes service corridor connects the guest wing and the guest kitchen, as it might be, right. with your kitchen. Oh, wow. <laughs> <laughs> Look at the range. Look at the range, yes. That's beautiful. That's absolutely amazing. But you've also got this dining area too. Easily more than we need. We haven't quite finished. Have a look at this. So it's a sort of circular route, this. This is the hallway. There's the front door. Imagine a door there separating you mm -hmm. from yeah. the guests. And then this is your living room. This is nice. You also get this uh, garden room. Uh, oh, that's nice. Oh, that's nice. You sort of pointed us towards the better end, but this is... As nice. As good. Yeah. yeah. This has a very different feel. That's contemporary. This is more traditional. Yes. Although it's effectively a new build, let's face it. Yeah. Um, there's the other staircase that gets you up to your accommodation up there. And that is comprised of three good-sized bedrooms in this wing of the house alone, including a spacious master with a washing area and a single room in the eaves, which leads onto a cosy twin room. And they all share a family bath and shower room. Unlike our other properties, there are no outbuildings as such for letting units. You'd be hard pushed to do much with the timber-clad barn. But they do have that 19 acres to play with if they wanted to develop a luxury campsite, and that includes two large paddocks and some private woodland. <laughs> Just wondering if we can afford it. Well, let's deal with that. <laughs> uh, you went la first last time, mm -hmm. so let's have your guess, sir. Three quarters of a million pounds you have. Yes. Um, is it going to be enough? I'm not sure that it is for this, so... I'd value it at something like 780. 740. 740. Yes. Hopefully coming in just <laughs> just under budget. Um, I have to confess, I think it should be that sort of figure, but today is your lucky day. This is on the market at 675. Oh, <laughs> oh gosh. What do we do? <laughs> <laughs> what do you do? That is a very good question. I think the first thing you should do is go and explore it at your leisure. We've whizzed round on the tour, but go and spend a bit more time, okay. soak it up, and I'll uh, find you later on. Okay. Fantastic. Thank you. Go on, then. Was Under budget by £75,000, our mystery house is an extended Welsh longhouse with contemporary additions and finished to a very high standard. It features a separate modern guest wing with two bedrooms as well as three in the main house, and the 19 acres of land gives Stephen Alley the option of developing a glamping business. The Mystery House has taken us both by surprise. We never expected to find a property of this quality and of this size at this price. I really like the Mystery House. I like it particularly because we would be able to run a business from here, and also Steve and I would be able to have our own home. Out you come. There we are. That's it. Our house tours are over.
Now, I've just been having a little bet with myself as to which one of our fabulous properties might be your favourite. Go on, then. You can tell me if I'm right <laughs> a little bit later on. Come on, let's go. The borderland between Wales and England is an area of unforgettable beauty, blessed with plentiful natural resources. Thanks to the abundance of coal, towns like Ironbridge and Shropshire became important centres of industry. It was here in the 18th century that cast iron was first produced on a large scale by using coal to smelt iron. The world's first cast iron bridge is an enduring legacy. Today, the region's ironworking heritage is being kept alive and well at the family-run British Ironworks Centre just outside Oswestry. It showcases and champions metalwork as an art form. I've come to meet one of its founders, Clive Knowles, in the centre's sculpture garden. It seems only fitting that the Ironwork Centre should be here. How did it come about? Well, it came about uh, approximately 12 years ago now, and we came across this wonderful 90-acre farm, and the idea was that we would eventually make it the mecca of metalworking here on the outskirts of Oswestry, and that we were going to celebrate all the different metalworking talents, coppersmithing, tinsmithing, blacksmithing, silversmithing, and we've got all these artists here for the public to come and see. The centre's eclectic collection of animal sculptures include the familiar from the farmyard as well as the more exotic. Clive is taking me to see a recent commission, a giant silverback gorilla made from thousands of spoons. Wow. <laughs> It's bigger than I was expecting. This is the Great British Spoon Gorilla. It's made from 40,000 spoons from primary schools all over the country and all over the world. It took six months of welding and about a year, 18 months of collecting spoons. The Gorilla sculpture was crafted by one of the centre's resident sculptors, Alfie Bradley, whose current project is in the early stages of development. An aim of the centre is to create artistic pieces that raise awareness of issues affecting the country. Alfie is building a statue of an angel made of knives, many of them collected by the police, which he hopes will help highlight the tragedy of knife crime. This is the knife angel. It'll stand probably 24, 25 feet in the air. This is just the spine and the wings of the angel. What, this huge... Chunk of steel here is, yes. is, is the framework, is it, Alfie? Well, what I'm going to do is I'm going to create a, a frame around the spine that I'm going to weld all these knives sideways like this. Wow. So, so they'll almost look like feathers. Exactly, yeah. This is a very different idea to the gorilla. This is tackling a very challenging and pernicious issue for us all, isn't it? This is addressing street violence, the carrying of weapons, Every knife taken off the streets of the UK is potentially a, a life save, and we are inviting any of the youths that are involved in gang violence or street violence or want to just come here and, and donate their own knife symbolically and weld it on themselves. They're being invited here to do that. And since I'm here at the workshop, Clive and Alfie have given me the honour of being the first member of the public to contribute to the sculpture. I know that you're a big fan of military history. So um, I managed to find this in all the pollen. You're right. joking, that? I think it looks military anyway. It absolutely is. That is a Second World War bayonet. Oh. I think it's a great choice. Thanks, mate. I appreciate oh, well, that. If you put yours right in the middle. Like that. Here's a pair of gloves that Thank you'll be needing. Thank you very much. Now, it's a while since I've done any welding. Yeah. You're going to have to judge my work at the end of it. We will. We'll be very critical. Yeah. <laughs> Everybody got their helmets ready to go? Brilliant. Yeah. Here we go. What do you think? Start at the top? Yeah. With over 100,000 knives needed to complete the sculpture, the centre is hoping to re-energise knife amnesties and that more weapons will be handed into the police over the next few months. Well, that's... How did well we do? Done. It's not going anywhere, no, is it? No, it isn't. It isn't. That's rock solid. Well, I must confess, I am really, really flattered to have had, as I say, a small part to play in creating what will be a beautiful sculpture. Yeah. And I think it's rather telling that welding this weapon of war that's now being attached to a symbol of peace, mm. I think it's quite profound. It's a brilliant it is idea. It's profound, yeah. Alfie's aiming to complete the Knife Angel by the end of 2015 when it will go on public show at the Ironworks Centre and, hopefully, 
will tour the rest of the country, helping to continue the metalworking tradition which originates from this historic region. Well, with the budget we've had this week, trying to decide which is the best property we've been able to show our buyers has been a pretty difficult task. I have my favourite, and I'm fairly sure that by now Stephen and Alison have theirs. But are we all thinking the same thing? Well, let's go and find out. We've given you some brilliant options, I think. All of them viable, all very different, different prices to boot as well. So which one is it? Which one is your favourite? Our favourite is the Mystery House. Is it? Yes. Ah. Why the Mystery House, then? Mystery House allows us to take that wonderful property, let it as B&B for a number of years, and then potentially divide it in two and let half of it as a high-quality holiday let. My money was on the house in Glengoslin. Yes. The six-bedder with the separate two-bedroom holiday let. Beautiful house. And you were very keen on buying that. Yes, very much. So what changed? I think it's a beautiful house, but with the mystery house, Steve and I would be able to have our own separate home, which is very important to both of us. What about the area? Well, our intention is to do some research on that, go back and have a second viewing, and if all goes well, mm -hmm. then put in an offer. Good. Well, guys, it's been a lot of fun. Uh, I'm delighted at what we've been able to show you. I am even more pleased that one of them, at least, has captured your hearts and your imagination and given you a vision for the future. And thank you very much for your help. It's been really great. Thank you. Well, let's be honest, if you are a buyer that's lucky enough to have three quarters of a million pounds in your back pocket, you are in a very enviable position. When we started this house search with Stephen and Alison, they did approach it with some pretty lofty ambitions, but I'm pleased to say that the property market here has not let them down. If anything, it's left them spoilt for choice, and at long last, I think they do now have a vision as to what their life here and their future may indeed look like. And as for me, well, I have loved seeing property, frankly, that is amongst the best that the Borders has to offer. I'll see you next time. If you'd like to escape to the country in either England, Wales, Northern Ireland or Scotland and would like our help, then please apply online at bbc.co.uk forward slash be on a show. Today's buyers can't wait to retreat into a relaxing rural environment as they head towards their retirement. And I come a cropper when I don't quite hit the mark with a certain piece of kitchen kit. The one thing that does concern me is the cooker. I've never not sold a house because of the size of a cooker. <laughs> and so I'll come in and do the work myself. I'll hold you to that. You, you wouldn't want it, mate. <laughs> <laughs> but our properties do come up trumps as they push entertaining opportunities to the max. That okay. would be very good if you wanted to have a marquee and a party, wouldn't it? You need to go on with the neighbours before we start planning those parties. <laughs> <laughs> Housewarming party. Oh, well, yeah, quite. Today, I'm in Cheshire, and these are the formidable ruins of Beeston Castle. Now, it's thought back in 1399, King Richard II buried a hoard of gold coins here before fleeing over to Ireland. It's a mystery that's literally rumbled on for centuries. So much so that back in 2009, English Heritage carried out an in-depth investigation, excavating deep down into this very well, which is quite some feat when you bear in mind it's actually the deepest medieval well in Britain. Now, to date, well, the king's supposed fortune is yet to be found. But as you're about to see, there's still plenty to discover across this beautiful county. Located in the northwest of England, the rolling hills of Cheshire are bordered to the east by Derbyshire, whilst to the west lies Wales. The county stretches over 900 square miles of unspoiled countryside, including lush pasture, ancient woodland and lowland heaths. To the east lie the Cheshire Peaks, part of the Peak District which was designated as Britain's first national park in 1951. With extensive vistas and windswept moorland, they provide the perfect setting for a range of outdoor pursuits. The hilly backdrop of the Peak District gives way to flat and rich expanses of the Cheshire Plains, known as the backbone of the region's dairy industry. Cheshire cheese has been churned here since the 11th century, 
making it the oldest named cheese in Britain. At the heart of the region is Chester. Once a Roman fortress site, it's now a thriving city offering a wealth of architectural treasures such as the Chester Roads, a unique collection of two-tiered shops built in black and white timbers dating as far back as the 14th century. With all this on offer, it's plain to see why Cheshire is a popular location for rural devotees. Cheshire not only delivers generously on countryside, its property values are fairly enticing too. As it stands, the average price of a detached house in the county is currently around £259,000. That's a rather generous £23,000 below the national figure. But of course, there are hotspots, and you can expect to pay around a 10% premium in the areas around the villages of Tarpley and Kelsall, due mainly to the fact they're considered commuter towns for Liverpool and Manchester. But if you head south towards more rural areas around the villages of Malpass and Farndon, then your budget will stretch quite a bit further. So why are today's buyers being lured to this rather charming county? Let's meet them and find out. Merchant banker Robert and practice nurse Paula met in a bar in 2007. Two years later, they moved in together and they now share a home in a suburban village within the borough of Stockport, Greater Manchester. The village is a convenient location for city commuters, but as our couple live on the main road, it's beginning to affect their quality of life. Although it's a village, it's actually between two towns in Romilly and Marple, and you get a lot of commuter traffic going both ways. There's definitely been an increase in the number of cars, um, particularly in rush hour. So, a journey to Stockport in the morning, although it's only five miles, can take us up to 45 minutes. When it comes to the new property, they have very definite desires and they're looking for the polar opposite of their current home, a striking 19th century converted chapel. It is unique and it was converted to maintain a lot of the original features. So we live upstairs and all the bedrooms are all downstairs. Although I love the house, I would like the kitchen downstairs. It's always quite difficult when we're entertaining carrying trays up and down the stairs. They now want a more conventional layout and are hoping that spiritual salvation will instead come from their newfound rural backdrop. I love the countryside. I've always been interested in walking, camping, the outside lifestyle. There's a lot of lovely little villages which are far more isolated than here, quieter, but still with a village atmosphere. Also, I have grandchildren not too far away and I didn't want to move a million miles away from where they are so I could have regular contact with them. Robert currently works from home, but they've both recently reduced their working hours. So as the pair of them edge towards retirement, this adventurous couple are looking forward to dedicating more of their time to their creative and sports-related pastimes. Both of us play golf, and I know that in that area there's quite a lot of uh, very good golf courses. I enjoy all sorts of things like patchwork, quilting, knitting. So I'm hoping that the countryside will inspire me to try various um, other crafts and perhaps develop the crafts that I already have. Now that their house is on the market, Robert and Paula are raring to go. And with their Jack Russell Toby by their sides, they're ready to begin their search. I feel now that the time is right to open a new chapter in our lives. So we can actually get settled in and be able to enjoy our retirement in, uh, in our new property. Our buyers are familiar with the Cheshire countryside and are hoping their new home will be in and around the large village of Tarpley. So that's the location sorted. But before we begin the house hunt, I need to find out exactly what they want from the property. Well, good morning. Good morning, Johnny. So who's behind this big decision? Who's the driver here? I suppose I am, really. I asked you the question. <laughs> I don't know what, I mean. what do you mean, really? Yeah. <laughs> I suppose Rob really would have been quite happy to stay where we are for another couple of years, but uh, I'm ready for a move. What do you plan to do? How are you going to make the most out of this countryside, Paula? I've always enjoyed camping. Maybe that's something I'll have to do <laughs> well, on I'm my own. I'm trying to find you a house. You've got to go camping. I'll just look for a field for you. That's easy. <laughs> I'll just have a big back garden. Was <laughs> ah. well, that important to you, then, a garden? A garden is important. I would just like to be able to open the doors and just potter outside as and when. Bedrooms. How many do we want? A minimum of three. Entertaining. Do you want open plan living? A big open plan kitchen diner would be nice. You're used to living in a, a character property. Yeah. Do you want to replicate that? 
We do want character, mm. but it could be a newish house with character. Location, where is this house situated? On the edge of a village. Yeah, OK. Not too far from a pub. Pubs, are, it's the heart of the community, isn't it? I and think so. We want to join in and, uh, you know, be part of that village. How much money are you looking to spend, Rob? Circa 650. So, the home you live in at the moment, what's going on with that? Are you for sale? Are you sold? What's the latest? It's gone under offer at the moment. So... That's brilliant. Yep. Yeah. Good. Scary. Scary? Yeah. Well, it means you've got to make this move, doesn't it? You're closer to it. It puts pressure on you. I don't mind that so much. <laughs> we better get going then, haven't we? Yeah, yes. no Let's pressure. Let's get started. Come on. I love pressure. What are you talking about? <laughs> I live for it. We thrive on it. Yeah. <laughs> With a top budget of £650,000, Paul and Robert would still like a character property, but with a more conventional layout. They need a minimum of three bedrooms, a modern open-plan kitchen diner, direct access to a garden and an edge-of-village location. We've scoured the property market and come up with an attractive selection of Cheshire homes to tempt our buyers, but they won't be told the price until the end of each tour. Then our final contender will be the rather magical Mystery House, where we're taking contemporary and character to a whole new level. So what are you going to do in the countryside? Well, we enjoy golfing where we are, so we're hoping that we'll join a golf club somewhere around here. Do you play golf together? Um, we Very try not to. <laughs> it's a great way to fall out playing together. <laughs> I can fall out with myself playing golf. <laughs> Who's the better golfer? Me. No. <laughs> <laughs> Our property search kicks off in the hamlet of Calverley. This is not far from their favourite village, the upmarket Tarpley, where handsome 18th and 19th century buildings line the high street. With a range of stylish independent stores, coffee shops and boutiques, it's home to a host of amenities, as well as a variety of restaurants and pubs. Just over four miles away and benefiting from rural views over the Cheshire Plains, is house number one. So here's our first property. What's your thoughts? Very attractive. Very it's nice. a barn. <laughs> it's a barn. Did you predict it was going to be a barn? We had a, an inclination it might be a barn, but yeah. It's a barn converted around six years ago. OK. Right. And it's got a wall garden around that looks secure and to let the dog out and yeah. just roam free. That looks perfect. Oh, now the Cheshire brick. Yes, it's lovely, isn't it? It is. It gives it character. Yeah, impressed. Impressed. Wonderful. That's just what we're looking for. Yeah. Wonderful, she says. Yeah, okay. Can't wait to get inside. Well, let's do just that. Follow me. Okay. This 19th century barn offers a space suitable for modern living whilst maintaining the original character of the property. Taken with the look of the exterior, I'm feeling positive that the fusion of old and new will also appeal inside. Let's see what you think of the first big room we come to. Nice. And I can see another little bit round the corner, so it's obviously quite flowing. Well, it is flowing, and I know you said you liked open, open plan. plan. Yeah. yeah. So, is this what you had in mind? It's lovely to see the garden straight outside. Yeah. And Good. I can picture opening the door into the garden. Good. Through here is where you'll probably snuggle up and watch the telly on a winter's night. OK. That's a nice space. How do you think you'd use this room? We have two rooms at home. I watch football in one, Paula watches programmes in the other, so it would suit us fine. Well, me and you, Rob, would be watching the football in here, <laughs> in, in, in here I think. <laughs> I, th I think we keep this exactly as it is, really. Yeah, I think it's, uh, it's positive. Good stuff. Kitchen next. OK. Come with me. Heading back through the open-plan living and dining area, we're making a beeline for what quite clearly is Paula's domain. It's possibly not quite as large as I would imagine, but because you've got this sort of dining area here... Mm. Ample for the two of us. I that. think it's fine. If you have friends around in the evening, you can be cooking, they can be mingling here mm. or outside in the garden. So, is, yes, I think it works. It's still got character because it's maintained the beams and yeah. everything, so it's, uh, yeah. Well, hopefully it's getting that nice fusion between the sort of old and new. And I think I can see a utility room just peeping off mm -hmm. there, so that works quite well. Let's look upstairs. OK. So far, so good. Next, we're going to view the sleeping quarters, where four bedrooms are split across two floors. In the eaves, there's a large ensuite bedroom, currently used for storage, but which could be a good office space for Rob. Then, on the first floor, there's a sleek family bathroom shared by the other three double bedrooms. 
One of them has its own staircase up to a mezzanine level used as a study. Another is a comfortable double, but we're stopping off at the bedroom I've earmarked for Paula and Rob. Nice size? Yeah? Is it? Is it a nice size? It is. It carries on around there. It's... All right. Mm, Paula thinks otherwise. Oh, no. Then the ensuite has not only a shower but a bath in. OK. Nice. And I like the height as well, the ceiling that goes up. I it just is. thought maybe where would you put a dressing table? I know she's got that under the window. On the window, then? Yeah, maybe. <laughs> maybe. <laughs> you could reconfigure it, couldn't you, anyway? Couldn't have a big mirror, though, then, because that would block out the light. That's the only Well, thing. that's the thing. Do you want a mirror or do you want a view? That would be a view. <laughs> oh, <laughs> see, sorry. I, I missed the opportunity for a sickeningly <laughs> cheesy compliment there, didn't I? I'll settle for the view. <laughs> <laughs> Should we go outside, take a look at the garden, mm -hmm. but also this is your first opportunity to start thinking about the price. Okay. All right, okay. fine. Okay. To the front of the property, there's a large double garage and parking for three cars. To the rear, the beautiful landscape garden frames a large lawn surrounded by established borders. As we make our way across the grass, I have one more surprise for our couple. So what do you think of the garden then, Paula? Decent enough size? It's a good size. I like it. I like the fact there's a lot of lawn on it, easy to maintain. Now, one thing you haven't seen is the other side of that wall, there's a paddock. Okay. About an acre. That comes with the property. That okay. would be very good if you wanted to have a marquee and a party, wouldn't it? Yes, well, I'd, uh, you need to get on with the neighbours before we start planning those parties. <laughs> Housewarming party. Oh, well, yeah, quite. So, how much do you think this barn conversion is on the market for? So, I'm going to go for 565. Five. Okay, Rob? I'll go higher than that, bearing in mind what our budget is, and I'll go for 625. <sighs> He's good. Is it? Spot on. This place on the market for <laughs> around 625. Yeah. Huh? I'll tell you what, go back inside this house. Have a good butchers and I'll catch you later on. Okay, right. thank you. £25,000 below the maximum budget, this converted barn with four bedrooms seems to offer the character and open plan living that our couple are after. Situated within an idyllic rural setting, it also comes with its very own paddock. I think the house inside delivered on every aspect that we asked for. I like the layout, I like everything about it, really. Interesting space, this, isn't it? It is. Not quite sure what you would use it for. Could always be an office. I don't know if it's big enough, really. Could always put the dog up here. <laughs> <laughs> I could see myself living here because being a converted barn, it's got character. It's light, it's airy, it's spacious, and it's a mixture of old and new. So, yeah, potentially we could. You know, I was thinking, you, you mentioned you'd love to have a house where you just open the door and your dog can run out. This is Jacko heaven, isn't it? <laughs> it certainly is. He'd love We're this. not buying a house for the dog, <laughs> but I do know what you mean. And it is, it's wonderful just stepping out into the garden. One down, two to go. Come with me. Just a stone's throw from the village of Tarpley are three lakes known as the Winsford Flushes. The flushes were created as a result of extensive salt mining in the 19th century, which caused the underground voids to collapse and flood. Covering an area of 200 acres and situated near to the River Weaver, these waters are considered locally to be Cheshire's answer to the Norfolk Broads. With their newfound freedom on the horizon, our active couple are keen to try out a new sport together, so we've arranged for them to have a sailing lesson with instructor Keith Sowling. Welcome to Winsford Flash Sailing Club. It looks lovely, I must say. Lovely location. Stunning, yeah. absolutely stunning. So have you done any sailing before? I've done a little bit of sailing, but unfortunately I've only had one or two lessons. I think you're a secret expert. No, definitely <laughs> not. <laughs> I, I can assure you I'm a complete novice. Don't right. Worry about that. Would we be considered quite old to learn to sail? We've got people here who are over 80 who sail. Wow, really? And myself and my wife we didn't learn to sail until we were over 50. Excellent. <laughs> OK, that sounds about perfect for us, yeah. yeah. <laughs> the sailing club opened in 1935 and, now in its 80th year, has 200 members. It's a blustery day on the riverbank, so it's essential for Keith to run through some basic training on dry land, as there are important safety measures to consider. Hold onto the boat. You can hang on to any of the ropes inside the boat. Yeah. Or 
there is a line going all the way around the gunnels that you can hold on to that if necessary. So what would happen if we capsized? You capsize because the wind is blowing from the side. We can let the sail out, but more importantly, we use our body weight. Could you have plenty of weight then? But... Well, <laughs> we'll see what happens. The club provides boats for beginners before they decide whether to purchase their own. Boats suited to this type of sailing can cost anything from a few hundred to seven or eight thousand pounds. I'll get in first. Armed with some basic skills, Paul and Rob are taking to the water. And off we go. You are sailing. Shall we go back now? <laughs> <laughs> the skill of sailing is learning how to harness wind power. One basic manoeuvre is called a tack which involves changing the position of the boat in relation to the direction of the wind. If the wind is coming from the right, the left sheet or rope is pulled tight to control the movable corner of the jib, also known as the main sail. OK, we're going to do a tack in a moment. So you grab hold of the left sheet. Are you ready? Ready. I've got a tack. Jib across. Let go of the jib. Oh, oh. There we go. <laughs> and up the side, Rob. That's it. Whilst the sails are pulled in the direction of the wind, it's crucial to maintain the balance of the boat by distributing the weight of those on board. OK, Rob, when the boat tips up, you need to come up this side a bit. OK? OK, if Paula sits a little bit further forward... Where? Down here? Towards the shroud, right up by the shroud. That's fine. So how are you finding it? Exhilarating. It's lovely, I'm really enjoying oh, this. Yes. Yeah. This is nice. As our couples sail off, it's clear that they're eager to embrace all that a rural life has to offer. But we still need to find them a property that lives up to their idea of country living too. Our next offering takes us to Church Minshaw, which is eight miles from Tarpley. Characterised by its Tudor-style architecture, this village is located within a conservation area. There's a popular local pub, village hall, and an active community, so I think Paula and Rob could find themselves quite at home here. Situated one and a half miles away in a peaceful rural setting is our second property. So here we are. And guess what? Not a bad. I'm Park and Mason. There's a theme running here, isn't there? Another similar development of similar vintage, really. This was converted just five years ago. OK. The original building is around 1890s. Yeah. What do we think? It seems quite tiny. Guess what? It's not. <laughs> it's very far from that. I like it, but it, everybody seems a little bit in close proximity to one another. I just I have got a few um, reservations about that. Valid point. There must be a back door. There is a back door. And yeah. you know what? This is probably the only property here with a back door you could use. Oh, right. And not be seen by the neighbours. Escape to the country. <laughs> yeah, quite. <laughs> when you step through that door, I think you might start feeling rather differently about the place. OK. Come on, mate. OK. This 19th century barn was originally a cow shed, which formed part of the adjacent farm. Converted five years ago, there are four dwellings, which all share a central lawned courtyard. When it comes to the house in question, the current owners reconfigured and extended the layout of the kitchen to take full advantage of the views to the rear of the property. Let's start off with the open plan aspect of this house. Nice. Like mm. it. Like it a lot. Yes. My style of kitchen, this. Is it? Yeah. Yeah. My, well, Paula's style of kitchen. My style of table to sit at. <laughs> Is it your spot there, <laughs> there man? A seat. <laughs> I, do, I do like it. I like the flooring. I like the door out into the garden. Plus, as well, you haven't just got the garden, you've got the fields beyond the garden, so that gives it a very open, rural feel. You're in the country now, aren't you? Certainly are. The one thing that does concern me is the cooker. It's quite a small cooker, and when you've got people at Christmas, I don't think there's enough space there if you're having a big family get-together at Christmas. You could put a double-width cooker in here, put a big range in here if you wanted to. Would, would that make you feel better about the room? It's a possibility, mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah, it's a possibility. Plenty of, plenty of cupboard space in there, so... Yeah, yeah. You could sacrifice one or two. OK, well, look, I've never not sold a house because of the size of a cooker. <laughs> and so <laughs> I'll come in and do the work myself. I'll Actually, hold you to that. You, you wouldn't want it, mate. <laughs> <laughs> All right, let's keep looking through. OK. Our couple seem to be warming to the property. The corridor takes us past the downstairs cloakroom and a dining room. But next, we're heading to the sitting room, where I'm hoping the positive vibes will continue. I don't like it as much. I think it's the flow of the house, really. 
it's the kitchen with a separate dining room and mm -hmm. I just think it's the carrying everything backwards and forwards from the kitchen to the dining room. It's a nice house. Yeah, the character of the beams and stuff, yeah, that's, that's spot on, but um, I'm not getting the wow factor from it. OK, let's go upstairs, see what you think of that. OK. OK. Sadly, we seem to have taken a backward step, but there's plenty more to impress, including a modern oak staircase from which the barn's height can be fully appreciated. On the first floor, there's a bathroom featuring a spa bath as well as four bedrooms. Three of these are doubles, which benefit from high ceilings and en suites and could be useful for visiting family or for converting into an office for Rob. There's also a small but bright single, but we're going to view the bedroom with the most character. High ceiling. Nice yeah. beams. Like that. Is this your master? It could be. No, the and features are nice and the Velux window and things. And the views yeah, out And the there, height and the views, yes. There's not really enough wardrobe space there, though, but then you could have more wardrobe space You could have a built-in wardrobe there, across there. You? No, it's mm. a nice room, yeah. It does have a lot going for it, but... I What's think missing? It's been sympathetically done, I'll give yeah. you that, but I don't think we'd ever use a dining room downstairs. Look, one of the main reasons we brought you here wasn't the internal parts of this house, it was the outside space and its outlook. So let me okay. take you there now. OK. Outside of the property, there is parking as well as a detached double garage. The main benefit of a corner plot in this development is that it boasts a generous lawn garden that stretches around the side and rear of the barn, where features include a paved patio and a raised decked area in a secluded spot. What's more, this property also has its own paddock. Amounting to just over half an acre, the land here is blessed with far-reaching views over open countryside. In contrast to the front of the property, the sprawling garden here feels quite private. Now, this garden is something special, isn't it? Oh, definitely. It's certainly so. big enough, without a doubt. Without thinking too far into the future, grown-up children now no longer living at home, the pitter-patter of grandchildren's feet, they'd want to come here, wouldn't they? They can have a football pitch there, can't they? I was thinking more pitch and put. Let's guess the price. How much do you think this house on the market for? I'd actually say it's more than the previous one. I got six forty-five. Paula? I would probably go for about 6.25. Well, you're both quite a bit out. This house is on the market for offers around £550,000. Oh, no. That does surprise me. £100,000 less than your budget. Would that money make you feel differently about your property? No. OK. Simple as that. Fair enough. Mm -hmm. But I do want you to go back inside this house, get a feel for what you get for your money, and then, well, I'll meet you whenever you're done. All right? OK. okay. Thank okay. you. Thank you. At £100,000 below the top budget, this converted barn has four bedrooms and offers a blend of character and contemporary features. Providing a large kitchen diner, private garden as well as an additional paddock, it's all set in a delightful rural location. Nice house, well presented, but I wasn't over impressed with the access to it. It's nice and the, throughout the house the woodwork's lovely. But um, this, to me, seems more spacious and larger room than the other one. I think this would probably be a master bedroom. Yes, it's definitely better. It's got the character, it's got the beams, but it doesn't quite have the flow that I would like to a house. So, all done inside and out? All done. All done. Well, hopefully I've given you something to discuss over dinner today. You certainly have. Yes, two barn conversions to compare. And one, I think, a clear winner. Let's take it back. OK. It's the second day of our property search with Robert and Paula from Greater Manchester. Their unconventional home is already under offer, so the pressure is on to find a more classic property in rural Cheshire with a budget of £650,000. Coming up, our mystery property delivers ultra-modern living with dimensions, character and luxury that should really raise the roof. This is what you call open space. Very impressive. Oh, yeah. Absolutely really, beautiful. really love it. And I explore the community life of traditional estate villages where I get hands on with some of the locals. Am I doing that right? Absolutely. Spot on. So, day two here in Cheshire, and it's a beautiful morning. But I must say, on reflection to looking at the houses yesterday, I think Paul and Rob had a clear favour out of those two barn conversions 
because one delivered the character and perhaps more importantly, that open plan configuration thereafter. Now today's property certainly delivers those two attributes, but of course, being the mystery house, or should I say the mystery property, it also comes with quite a big challenge. Let's see how we get on. For our mystery house, we're heading to Northwich. It's 10 miles from Tarpley, so it's the furthest village away from Rob and Paula's ideal location. Close by is the village of Cuddington, which originally flourished in 1870 due to the completion of the Manchester to Chester Railway. Today, residents are served by a family butchers, a pub and a few local shops. But sitting just outside the village and set within 14 acres on its own private estate is our mystery property. For a couple comfortable living in a converted chapel, I couldn't resist presenting them with something featuring such history and style. And I'm hopeful that this one should be well worth the potential compromise. So, this is us. What do you make of this? It looks like a fantasy castle. It's got a touch of that, hasn't it? It's certainly different. Wow. It's obviously building. not the whole thing. <laughs> no, I, I, I don't <laughs> think I don't think you want to heat the whole thing or yeah. repair the roof. Massive, but, it's a uh, castle. It is. Now, we are staring at a late 19th century baronial style mansion. Mm. We will be looking at an apartment in this mansion. All right. All right. Okay. okay. Yeah. Now, this was designed by architect John Douglas for a couple of brothers who were merchants who unfortunately their business collapsed when they lost their ships in the blockade of Charleston. So they never got to live in this beautiful property. And is it a ground floor apartment we would be looking at? That's the rub. No. Oh. Okay. <laughs> and the property we're going to have a look around is on the left hand side there. Okay. First right. floor? Yeah, first floor. Do you want to look inside? Please say yes. Definitely yes. Yes. Good, come on. Come on. Dating back to 1897, this Grade II listed baronial mansion was once a hospital before it was converted into eight homes in the 1990s. Designed to challenge our couple's mindset, our two-storey mystery apartment delivers historic style with a difference. Providing a magnificent and modern open plan layout of more than 2,000 square feet, I have a feeling that this will push contemporary and character beyond the realms of what Paula and Rob could ever have imagined. Now, the first big feature is this. Wow, what a staircase. That's something else, isn't it? <laughs> it is. It keeps it light as well, doesn't yeah, it? Yeah, it's clever, isn't it? This glass yeah. staircase was imported from Germany right. by the developers that refurbished this entire flat. So is it sold as soon? There's often a deal to be done, but let's see what you think of them. OK, great. Let's go. Now, this... It's got to impress anyone, surely. <laughs> How can you not be impressed with a room this like this? This is lovely, isn't it? Absolutely glorious. Quite modern um, fixtures and fittings as well, but it just blends in perfectly, doesn't it? This is what you call open space. This is very impressive. Oh, yeah, Absolutely I really, beautiful. really love it. Yeah. <laughs> Do love it. <laughs> Let's go and take a look at the kitchen, then. So, you like the idea of open plan kitchen and living areas. Is this...? What you're after, then? You can live in this room. You've got a dining area there, you've got a social area there, and it just flows, doesn't it? Now, have you got enough ovens? Yes. Yes. Yeah? Oven. Ovens. Uh, <laughs> three here, isn't there? I wonder what the architect, John Douglas, would have thought when he designed this to be a billiard room, then suddenly someone stuck a contemporary kitchen unit in the middle of it. I think he'd be snookered. Oh, <laughs> dear, oh, dear. Come with me. What fantastic reactions. Perhaps Rob and Paula like this property so much as it features unique characteristics similar to those in their current home. But before I jump to any conclusions, there's one more room to show them on this floor. Now, there is a master bedroom on this level, which okay. is this. Oh, beautiful. Oh, again, again, very it? tastefully decorated, isn't it? Somebody's done a fabulous job yeah, on this. Yeah, they knew what they did. <laughs> they yeah. went to this place. Yeah. Without a doubt. Yeah. In there, you've got a really cool wet room. Uh -huh. OK. This mystery property delivers in other things that you haven't asked for, like the contemporary decor. Yeah. But do these sway you or are they just impressing you? You can't help but be impressed by the mm. way this has been done. Yeah, it's certainly given me something to think about. That's good. Follow okay. me. Split over two floors, there are a total of three bedrooms. Up on the third floor, there are two beautifully presented doubles, one with built-in storage and another which could be an office for Rob. 
But I'm itching to show our couple what I feel is another high-spec highlight of this property. Now, I think this is where the developer has showed their worth. <laughs> this is impressive. Unbelievable. You could go to seeing that. <laughs> Three men in a boat. Now, another thing you might not have seen so far, that's a wicked little flat-screen TV. <laughs> I'll leave the rest to your imagination. Let's go outside. OK. Outside, the grounds amount to a vast 14 acres featuring beautiful landscape gardens and a lake, all managed by a committee of residents. This private setting could also provide our couple with the ideal environment for dog walking. Rob and Paula appear to appreciate everything about this property, but I want to know what they really think about its potential as their future home. So here we are. I wouldn't like to mow the lawns. No. 14 th acres, but... Uh... Thankfully, you don't have to. That's Good. all covered for you. OK, well, look, you've not really talked about how you fit into this equation. I'm still trying to get my head around that. Yeah. Being a first-floor apartment... Yeah. ..and the practicality of where I'd have an office. Yeah, you'd have to sacrifice one of those bedrooms, I'm And afraid. those bedrooms are too nice to sacrifice. <laughs> <laughs> Time to guess the price. How much do you think this house is on the market for? I'm going to go for... 480. OK. I'll go higher. I still think it's below our budget, but I'll go at 560. He's good. This place is on the market for offers around £550,000. 2 1. Yes, 2 1. <laughs> <laughs> so, it is within budget, but I'm starting to get. It's, there's lots of things you like about it, but it perhaps isn't a home for you. No, I, I don't think it's a home. No. I, I, as I it's just... a lovely property. Love that. I'm glad yeah. you showed it to us because it is. It's, uh, yeah. it's stunning. And Good. somebody will make it into a wonderful, wonderful place to live. Again under budget, our high spec contemporary mystery apartment has three bedrooms and is configured so that modern open plan living complements the original character of the mansion. With a huge acreage of land, it's also located on the outskirts of a village. The mystery house has been done to a style that I, I really love. The facade is stunning. The grounds are stunning. I felt at home in the mystery house immediately. It was just the feeling of the light and the space, the airiness. It reminded me, in certain respects, of the property that we already live in. If the mystery house was on the ground floor and we had the doors going out into the grounds, then I would certainly say it would be a contender. All done? Yes, thank Suitably you. Suitably impressed? Very you can't impressed. fail with impressed, can you? Well, unfortunately, that's all the properties we're going to have a look at. Okay. So, time now to find you somewhere to have a bit of a chit chat, and I'll catch up with you after that. Okay, okay. thanks a lot. Thank you. In the east of Cheshire lies the Tatton Estate, which is the largest private landowner in the area, originally owned by the Egerton family for 400 years. Since 1957, it has been under the stewardship of the Brooks and falling within the estate are several thousand acres of land and over 500 properties. Sitting within the land are the two beautiful estate villages of Rostern and Bostock Green, which have remained virtually unchanged since the late 19th century. With foundations laid in 1775, Bostock Green features a number of individual Georgian and Victorian cottages, characterised by their uniform cobbled paths and white fences, all built from red bricks fired in the local kiln. I've come to the village to meet with current custodian Henry Brooks and to learn more about the estate and village life. Hello Henry, how are you? Very well, good morning, welcome to Bostock. Thank you very much, lovely to be here. Now, Bostock, it seems to be a village with a difference. Absolutely. Bostock is, is a traditional estate village, um, which has a strong sense of unity. It's also historic as the centre of the old county of Cheshire. The tree that you came past on your, on your way in yep. um, marked the old centre before the boundary changes. Now, this community here forms part of a much bigger estate. A absolutely. What are we talking? You've got businesses located on the estate as well? We have. We see everything from your traditional farms and agricultural businesses mm. uh, right up to sort of more intense sort of retail and, and industrial type businesses. You're bringing jobs back into a village. In order to preserve villages, 
we feel you have to actually invest and create new things um, to, to retain young people um, um, and opportunities. So wonderful story of we've been able to get the old village hall, which was completely derelict and falling down, um, and we've managed to invest in it uh, to, to repair it and bring in a nursery school, which has brought children into the village. Now I'm on my way to see dairy farmers. Give me a heads up, are they likely to get me working for them? Uh, I, I have absolutely no doubt. Rob well, Bob <laughs> thank you so much, Henry. No, thank you. I'm making my way to meet up with third generation farmer Adrian Smith, who has run a farm just outside of Bostock Green for 50 years. Together with his son Jason, they are tenant dairy farmers on the estate. What does it mean to you guys living and working in the village then, Adrian? It's part of my history, part of my life. It's got a great tradition. It's a lovely part of the centre of Cheshire. A very unique place to live, yeah. Now, there must be some new technology, some new practices that you might be urging your father to use at all. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I'd, I'd like to bring in a computerised herd management system. But that's not too keen on it, because it means dealing with computers. I mean, there's yes. a lot of tradition with farmers anyway, mm. skills being handed down. Yeah. Does that mean a lot to you? Yeah, it does. It does. I mean, some, somewhere like Boston, that's got a lot of history, it's important not to lose that history, keep the traditions in place. But on the other hand, then, we have to have sustainability. So to survive here, we have to modernise too. Now, Jason, you milk how many times a day here? Twice? Twice a day. Today. Can we go up the fields now, shall we? Yeah, mm -hmm. sure, absolutely. With over 20 million litres of milk consumed each day in the UK, some 2 million cows across the country must be milked to keep up with the demand. Come on in, milk! It only takes 10 minutes for the cows to make their way from the fields to the milking parlour. Here they're fed a nut-based nutrient mix to keep them calm whilst the milking process takes place. Well, how long will this process take each cow, do you think? Depending on how much milk they're going to give, roughly about 10 minutes. This is all automatic, is it? This is all automatic, computerised. It can tell when the cow's done, finished milking. Looks fairly simple. Can I yep. have a go? Your turn. Depending on their stage of life, each of these cows is capable of producing between 10 and 60 litres of milk a day. Make sure all these are facing downwards. OK, right. You can see it's me and Tidy. We go up to the cow. <laughs> so I keep this nice and high, and then guide it up. Am I doing that right? Absolutely spot on. Once the cow has finished milking, the units remove themselves automatically. How many cows do you say you have in the herd? In the milking herd, there's 185. Goodness me, so you've got 185 cows to milk, to milk tonight. tonight. We better get on with it, haven't we? We better crack on. Right, OK, let's go that way. Let's go. Well, modern methods may be replacing traditional skills, but farming still takes hard graft, dedication and long hours through all seasons and weather. And it's been fascinating to experience firsthand how generations of families are continuing the legacy that has long been the backbone of rural village life. Well, from my perspective, property number one is pretty much led from the front. But after some time to reflect, let's find out what Rob and Paula's thoughts are. A bit of time to think things through. I think there's one clear favourite, and that's that first barn conversion. What do you think of it now? I think it merits a second viewing. It had everything that we really wanted in a property. The garden was a, an ideal size. It had a, had a bonus of a pasture, which um, we weren't expecting. And the layout just worked perfectly for us. What sort of things are you going to look out for on your second viewing? We would have to have a drive round and get to know the local area a little bit better. Yeah. And just perhaps look how the configuration would work out for us as well. So we showed you the mystery property, which was, I'm sure, something you weren't Stunning. expecting Stunning. at all. Could you see yourself ever leaving an apartment sometime in the future? Yes, I think we could see ourselves living in an apartment, although it wasn't something that I probably would have considered until today. Perhaps, though, as you get older, if you lived in an apartment, you would need a lift. Yeah, imagine the mystery property was on the ground floor. Mm -hmm. What do you think about it then? If it had direct access out into the garden, then I think it probably would have been ideal. That's quite a journey then, isn't it? I mean, you'd never have thought you'd be looking at apartments and considering them as places to live, did you? Open-minded. Well, when are you thinking of revisiting that barn conversion? We'll have to be pretty soon because um, our own property is actually under offer at the minute, so uh, we can't leave it too long. There's nothing like necessity to urge you on, is there? No. Well, I wish you the best of luck at that second viewing, but please let me know what you decide on doing in the end, don't you? Will do. Of course we will. Yes. Thank you. 
Well, it's certainly great news that Rob and Paula want to go back for a second viewing on that first barn conversion. And I think that's basically because it worked for them. Certainly on paper, it gives them everything they said they wanted, but most importantly, that open plan configuration inside and a house that has a back door opening onto that glorious garden. So, for the second viewing, they need to ask themselves one very important question. Can they turn that house that works for them into a home that they love? Looking forward to finding out what they think. See you next time. If you would like to escape to the country in Wales, Scotland, Northern Ireland or England and need our help, please apply online at bbc.co.uk forward slash be on a show. Today's couple have spent the past few years dreaming of a complete lifestyle change in the country. So it's all hands on deck trying to find them their perfect place. This has sort of blown me away slight somewhat. <laughs> I didn't think we could get this sort of thing on our budget. And we go all out in a bid to give them what they want. Not too shabby, it's is it, really? It's not too shabby, do you want to <laughs> Well, today we are in Shropshire, and this is the parish church of St Lawrence in lovely Ludlow, one of two resting places of Prince Arthur, Henry VII's eldest son. Now, aged just 15, Arthur came to live in Ludlow Castle with his new wife, Catherine of Aragon, but just six months later, he tragically died, paving the way for his brother Henry VIII to ascend to the throne and marry his widow, the first of Henry's notorious six wives. Now, as for Arthur himself, his body was buried in Worcester, but his heart was interred in a casket beneath the church itself, giving Ludlow and this glorious county a long-lasting royal connection. Home to some 300,000 inhabitants, the county of Shropshire is part of the West Midlands region, with Worcestershire to the southeast and the border with Wales to the west. Shropshire covers some 1,300 square miles of rich and rugged countryside, and flowing through the county is England's longest river, the Severn. Its most iconic crossing point is Thomas Telford's Bridge, constructed in 1779, and the first of its kind to be built from cast iron. It arcs across the river at the town which took its name, Ironbridge, and was granted world heritage status in the mid-1980s because of its pivotal role in Britain's Industrial Revolution. Travel further south and you'll traverse the Shropshire Hills, a mass of sprawling peaks and valleys that cover a quarter of the county. Scattered across this area of outstanding natural beauty are examples of diverse geology such as the Stiper Stones, a wild ridge of quartzite that was formed around 500 million years ago. Shropshire is also home to the medieval market town of Ludlow that began life in the 11th century. Here you'll find almost 500 listed buildings and a dazzling mix of architecture, including examples of Norman and Tudor design. It's a county that doesn't disappoint, and it's an enticing area for those looking to swap a suburban existence for an exciting adventure in the country. So just how deep do you think your pockets have to be if you want to afford a slice of Shropshire life? Well, the good news is not that deep. The average price of a detached property here is currently £247,000. And whilst, yes, it is nearly a quarter of a million, it is nonetheless £35,000 below the national figure. And with one of the lowest population densities anywhere in the UK, there is plenty of space for everyone to enjoy. So let's meet today's buyers and find out what's attracted them to this beautiful part of the country. Lisa, a marketing consultant, and James, a web developer, have been married for two years. They met through mutual friends who live in Ludlow. I'm on a camping trip with the same set of friends and I was putting my tent up and out of the corner of my eye I thought, that is a very nice looking man over there. I'm going to bounce across and say hello. I thought he was Colin Firth out of Pride and Prejudice and I was gone. <laughs> and that was it. We're very, very different people, but we mesh, which means that together we come to a consensus and we work as a team very well. We're a good team, aren't we? Yeah. They're based in the commuter town of Guildford in Surrey, but after recently being gifted money from family, they plan to relocate and live mortgage-free in Shropshire. We want to expand ourselves and we want to change the way we live. Living in suburbia doesn't really suit us very well. Both of us have come to that realisation. So moving to the countryside gives us the opportunity to do that. 
They're passionate about their pastimes. James loves motorbikes and Lisa practices yoga and meditation. They'd like a property with enough land to create a campsite offering yurts, a glamping experience where paying guests can enjoy the outdoors in more comfort. But that's not the only reason they're making this move. The other half of the sort of lifetime plan is to give back to the community and we're hoping that if we have the right house, we can put we can in for become, a fostering. Yeah, we can become foster and parents. look after some kids that, you know, haven't been so lucky as us. Our couple started the fostering process in Guildford, but soon realised their rented home was not going to be big enough. They looked into buying a bigger property, but the prices were unaffordable and they decided it was time for a change. I really want to create a space where, you know, a child will be able to pull up in the back of the car and look outside and think, wow, this, is, this looks OK, I quite like this. They clearly want a lot from their new home, and there's a lot riding on it. It's really difficult sometimes to talk about it because it's this dream come true, and it is overwhelming. It's overwhelming in a really beautiful way. Our buyers would like to be within a half an hour drive of historic Ludlow, where close friends live, but rural enough for the lifestyle they have in mind. Before we begin viewing properties, I'm meeting up with James and Lisa in the county to get a better understanding of what it is they're looking for. Well, Lisa, James, welcome to Shropshire. Thank you. This Thank is you. all very exciting, isn't it? <laughs> yes. Now, you've brought to this search a big list of wants. Well, you're rubbing your hands together. <laughs> um, I think we really need to get to the bottom of what you're trying uh, to achieve. So just talk us through your ambitions, because I think ambition is the word that really underwrites what you're trying to well, do. Well, what we really want to do is change the way we live our lives. Um, We're coming to the countryside to have this wonderful life and to fill it with foster children and create a really nice, wonderful space for them to be and for them to grow. But you've also got some additional ideas, haven't you? Well, One hoping... or two. <laughs> <laughs> Come on, James, tell me. Well, we're hoping to um, get a little more income in through doing holiday let business. Mm. Um, camping to begin with, uh, so we're hoping for a little bit of land, maybe outbuildings that we can convert, that mm. sort of thing. We've considered yurts as well because yeah. they're flexible structures. Mm -hmm. uh, I know you're very keen on having a workshop in which yes, to tinker. definitely. Just a little bit. Just a little bit. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And what are you going to do in this workshop, James? Um, my father rebuilds old British motorcycles. I want to carry on that tradition from him. I also want to be able to look after the holiday let, to be able to look after the kids, you know, build things for them, yeah. that sort of stuff. The main thing is the family and the children. That's the primary concern. Now, you've thought about this for a long time, but between you, give us a quick rundown of what this property should look like. What kind of style have you been dreaming about? So it's a family farmhouse, traditional. We want it to be lived in, and we want something that maybe is a little bit wonky, something that's unusual and quirky. We're not run-of-the-mill people. A um, little bit of curb appeal would be good, you know, the wow factor as we turn it up. So you want something that's, as you say, worn round the edges, a bit quirky, a bit eccentric. What don't you want? A recent barn conversion, double height, all mod cons. We want it to be nice and cosy. Any minimalist just, stuff. Yeah, not Or the things that we have to really put want, away yeah. so that it looks nice. <laughs> it's not going to happen. <laughs> you know, money is going to be the key ingredient in trying to make this happen. So let's just remind ourselves of the budget, James. Yeah. OK, our maximum budget, absolute maximum, is going to be 400000 Yeah. We can certainly Good. find you a house that can contain a family and a growing family at that. Mm -hmm. The business side of it for the budget is going to be difficult. Fine. to be honest. So we've got three properties to show you. Should we go hunting? <laughs> yes, Let's please. £400,000 is a good budget, but it is going to be a challenge fulfilling such big ambitions. They want a characterful farmhouse with scope to accommodate two to three foster children, enough land to run a yurt camping business, outbuildings for James to tinker in, and all this should be close to desirable Ludlow. We've lined up a fine selection of properties that I think will do the trick, but James and Lisa won't find out the price until the end of each house tour. And finally, I'll show them the mystery house, which may be a risky choice given their style preferences, but if they embrace it, could be the answer. It's going to be interesting to see how you... React. Yeah, how you react, how you unpack what these properties can offer you and how they will hopefully begin to fulfil this huge list of really <laughs> exciting ideas that you've brought to the process. Yeah. Or maybe cross some off. Or that's maybe cross some off. The thing is, yeah. go, well, hang on a minute, that was a good idea last week. <laughs> what are we going to cross off the list yeah, all to of make it more manageable? 
<laughs> We've gone totally off that idea. <laughs> well, let's see what you make Thank of you. our first property. Looking forward to this. Mm. We're starting our house hunt in the village of Clunton, which is a 15-minute drive from Bishop's Castle, a civil parish to the west of Shropshire, close to the Welsh border. Bishop's Castle is a characterful medieval market town on the fringes of the spectacular Shropshire Hills. It has a population of just over 1,600 and offers a wide selection of amenities. Some may also visit the local brewery to sample the beer from what is thought to be one of the oldest breweries in Britain. Back in Clunton, our first property is just a 25-minute drive away from Ludlow. Right, let's see what we're going to start with then. Come down here, because this, I think, is really where you get the best initial view of it. There you go. Oh, wow. that's lovely. Now, you said you wanted something that was a bit sort of wonky. <laughs> and wobbly. Wonky in the right places. Yeah. yeah. Wonky yeah. in the right places. Now, that bit up to the wisteria hmm. is 1650. OK. That bit's 20 years old. You can just see... Yeah, the tiles are a different colour. In yeah. the slates, oh, yeah. Oh, now you've pointed it out, you can. Yeah, yeah. happy so far? Oh, so, I'm excited. <laughs> can we have a look? <laughs> yes, yeah. please, yes, please. The original cottage was used as a stopover for drovers who had herd livestock to market. It was built from stone and slate with oak timbers. Now, you might need to duck a little bit. I love the fireplace. I absolutely love that. Wood burner in there, of course. Yeah. Lovely traditional ingle nook. Nice and cosy, isn't it? Yeah. For me, coming into a room like this, and as I'm short as well, I feel nice and snuggly and warm. I could quite happily sit on this sofa and let the world go by already. But go through there. That's the dining room. OK. Uh, as you can see, um, it opens up a bit in here, a little yeah. more height. I don't know where to look first. The floor, the <laughs> ceiling, the fireplace. <laughs> I'm looking at the windows, there's a little picket gate there with some nice foliage. I'm just going to have a look round here. And there's another <laughs> view out, that one. You are taking in every single detail. Mm -hmm. Clearly working for you in character. That's the nice thing about yeah. it. OK. Well, let's have a look at the kitchen. That's through here. OK. Now, when you get into here, it opens up yet again. That's what's nice about this kitchen. Now, I know you do have some reservations about things that are uber modern. Uh, an uber slick. This is a modern kitchen. It has all mod cons, everything's mm. built in and integrated, but it's been done with a really nice contemporary country twist. I have now realised that that's something we hadn't thought about. Everything needs to work, it needs to be easy to get to, you need lots of surfaces. It can't necessarily do any harm to have modern in the kitchen. Now, through here, we've got you one of the four bedrooms, one of the three ensuite bedrooms. Mm -hmm. So, ground floor option there. Mm -hmm. Now, that room would, in itself, make a fabulous master bedroom. But mm -hmm. there is an even better one upstairs. Come and have a look at this. We're heading upstairs to the remaining bedrooms. One is a small single with a built-in wardrobe, and then there are two further ensuite doubles. One is a light and airy dual aspect with its own bright bathroom but I'm showing James and Lisa one with bags of character. There we are. Isn't this a treat? Oh, wow. I love the vaulted ceiling. We wanted quirky and wonky and character and something unusual. It's also got an ensuite. Have a look at this. Wow. Here we are. Shower ensuite as well. This has sort of blown me away slight somewhat. Um, <laughs> I didn't think we could get this sort of thing on our budget. Well, let's talk about the budget outside and see if you can afford it. <laughs> Whether or not there'll be any change after you, madam. Thank you. Thank you. This house has a large lawn garden at the front of the property with mature borders, a pond stocked with fish and a gravel patio for enjoying sunny afternoons. At the back is a hard landscape cottage garden with a varied selection of established plants and shrubs. A further seating area, another fish pond and a workshop adjacent to some land that's primed for building on, subject to planning permission. So as you can see, you've got this nice little sort of courtyard arrangement at the back of the property. Oh, nice little very sun trap, isn't it? It, it is. really is, actually. It is. But, as you can see, land-wise, it doesn't have the acres mm. that you were perhaps mm. dreaming of, and that is one of the kind of issues with making your budget work. How do you feel about that? confused a little bit and I'm beginning to notice in my head those parameters are beginning to change say well you know could we maybe 
get some land from somewhere else. This is such a nice house. Could we compromise on the other parts of the business? The kids would love it here. It's messing with my head a little bit. OK, so we've got your very, very lovely house in a really nice spot. You've got up to £400,000 mm -hmm. to spend. Okay. Now then, James, make us an offer on property number one. I'm going to guess around 380. Well, I actually had 375 in mind, hopefully. You wish. <laughs> ah! <laughs> Look, all is not lost. You're not okay. far away from it. This could be yours for 389. That's not a not million miles off. away. No, not it's not a million miles away. And of course, like everything, it's open to offers. So, mm -hmm. yeah, maybe your 375 isn't so far away. Go and have a look around. The house is yours, and I will catch up with you a little bit later on. Great stuff. Good stuff. Thanks. Off you go. Enjoy. This cottage has come in £11,000 under budget and has quirky features that have excited Lisa and James. There are four bedrooms, three of them en suite, that would suit any future foster children. And the property is located in a lovely rural setting, less than half an hour from Ludlow. Oh. OK. That's a big bedroom. It's um, very modern, isn't it? I didn't expect it to be quite so modern. What do you think? Well, I like it as a bedroom, but it is a bit over-modern for what I was expecting. So when we first arrived at the house, my gut reaction was, oh my goodness, this is really pretty, this is exactly meeting the brief. But as I moved through the house and saw the more modern areas, I'm afraid it felt a bit flat, and that's where I'm stuck a little bit. I think the way the house blends the quirkiness, old-fashioned eccentricities of when it was built with the modern touches here and there works really well. I think it's definitely a contender. Ah, here we go. All done? Yep. Good start. Good start, yeah. Good you going to buy it? Let's see the others, I think. <laughs> <laughs> Come on, then. Part of James and Lisa's business plans are to offer yurts as a glamping experience. So we've sent them to meet up with Henry and Mary Dowell, experts when it comes to these portable structures. Hi, welcome. Hi, nice Hi. And welcome to our home and Hi. our yurt making business. Hi, I'm Henry. Henry's education in yurt making started over 10 years ago when he travelled around Mongolia, a country synonymous with yurts, and lived in these semi permanent dwellings along the way. Where did your passion for yurt making come from? The passion for yurts has come from living in yurts and travelling with yurts, and they're just such amazing structures that you can take down and fit in the back of a van and transport, set up home in a comfortable, cosy way without leaving a footprint on the ground at all. You know, when you're gone, you're gone. There's no trace of where you've been living. So I'd like to know about the maintenance and how you look after your yurts. Well, we always say that a yurt which is lived in is a yurt that is looked after. If you put your yurt up and you use it and you light the fire and you clean leaves and bird droppings off the canvas and then also reproof it every year or so, then it'll keep looking lovely. It takes up to a month to make all the components for a medium-sized yurt, which has a 20-foot diameter. Henry's showing Lisa and James how certain parts of the yurt are made. He's starting with the rafters and uses locally sourced ash. We use ash because it is a very strong timber. It is very straight-grained. It is really springy. Also, it's quite lightweight, so for a portable yurt, that is perfect. And what we do is we use steam to make a straight bit of wood bent like so. So we need the curve at the bottom to be kind on the canvas right. and also to add extra head height inside the yurt. It takes roughly one hour per inch in the steam box to saturate the wood and make it malleable. Here we go. Okay. We so we've got about 10 seconds to get this whilst it's still hot. That's it. And that over there, if you can just grab a tie from down there by your feet, that's it. Lovely. We'll tie that off. Lovely. Next, Henry's showing them how to fix the rafters into the crown, which acts like its roof. We need a square hole in the crown to, so that the rafters don't slip and slide when they go in. With a copper brand, we'll sear through the wood, mm -hmm. so the action of the heat seals the wood, makes it stronger, and it also gives us our nice square hole. Push that through, see? If Lisa and James do decide to move forward with their glamping business, they'd have a variety of yurt sizes to choose from. The most popular yurt size the Dows make sleeps four to six people and costs around £7,000. However, these structures can be built on a really large scale, 
One that provides enough space to host a large wedding comes with a price tag of around £27,000. They're rigging a 16-foot diameter yurt, which should take about an hour. The team are starting with the main entrance, from which the trellis sides of the structure are attached and then joined together using rope. The next part is the tension band, like a belt which holds the whole thing together. Henry holds the crown in position so the rafters can be fixed into the square holes. James and Lisa could expect to fetch up to £700 a week in high season for a family-friendly yurt. One, two, three, four, five, six. The rafters are then tied to the trellis to secure the roof. Lisa and James should bear in mind that they would need planning permission to erect yurts permanently on their land for commercial purposes. So you make a loop like that? Ah, uh, OK. It's like a half hitch. The canvas is split into four sections. A roof, two separate wall covers and a cap that goes over the crown. The door is in the right place and the wheel at the top is in the right place. Yeah, yeah that's done it. James then sorts out the yurt's central heating system, come cook up. Rigging this yurt seems to have given our buyers a newfound confidence. Once we've done a couple of tries, these are going to be really easy to take up and put down again. It's a lot easier than I thought it would be. Yeah, yeah. Yay. And they're now fully prepared for what their potential glamping business might entail. Good luck with your house, hon. Yeah, thank, thank, you. thank you. So armed with this newfound knowledge, James and Lisa are a step closer to getting their own yurts off the ground. Back to our house hunt and we've made a bold decision. James and Lisa have big goals for the first home they're buying together. They want a mix of internal space and outside land, so we've crossed the border into Wales to the county of Powys, where you can get a bit more for your money. The property is next to a village called Aber Mule, which is a 10 minute drive to the historic market town of Montgomery. It's an area well known for its castle, a Norman ruin that sits on top of the hill overlooking the market town. Other local landmarks include the Georgian Town Hall that dates back to 1748. And there's also a helpful array of local amenities that James, Lisa and their potential family could make use of. The next home I'm showing them is situated in the hills of Abermule, but is further away from Ludlow. Well, I should probably start by saying uh, welcome to Wales. Thank you. Look at that. Absolutely gorgeous. Wow. And it is designed to make the best use of this. I'm stunned. And this, as you can probably tell, is a property very much of two halves. 1700 there, mm -hmm. little mm -hmm. cottage, with a seven-year-old addition here. Wow. It's quite a contrast. This gives you the best of both worlds, because we know. <laughs> <laughs> we know now, don't we, from the kitchen in property one, that actually a bit of modern's OK. So this combines some very slick modern with some very old old. What do you think of it, James? It's beautiful. Lisa? I don't know. <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not convinced. Really? Really? Initially, for curb appeal for me, I don't want to run up and give it a big cuddle. Well, let's see if it gives you a cuddle from the inside, because I think it will. Oh, good. And it does make the best of those views. Come and have a look around. I was hoping that Lisa might find the quirky nature of this house exciting, but it's not wowed her from the outside. However, she'll see the property does deliver generously inside and in different styles of decor. Through the mahogany-clad entrance hall is the kitchen, which really makes a modern statement. Okay. Now that's a modern kitchen. That's a modern kitchen. <laughs> wow. Not too shabby, it's, is it, really? It's, it's, it's not, not too shabby, Jules, no. <laughs> um, I really like the wood. Yeah. I really like the cooker there. Yeah. But I'm being very practical immediately, saying, well, if the cooker's there, well, there's no work surface outside the cooker. Well, come and have a look at the rest of it. <laughs> look, you know, you've got this whole kind of preparation area here. Double sink and so on. Yeah. Mood wall. I'm really confused because there's loads of work surface and there's loads of cupboards. Just start to take it in because this is a property that really does reveal itself. And it's absolutely made by the new bit that you're not so sure about. But my hunch is that you may, <laughs> may eat those words. Come and have a, oh. a look to here. We're leaving behind the older part of the house, which also provides a cosy snug and a spacious downstairs mahogany panelled family bathroom. Next, we're making our way to the modern extension that has a well-appointed utility and downstairs cloakroom, as well as separate dining and living rooms. Now, that's the design element. 
Right. <laughs> Come over here. Mm. I totally get how this is all opened up to the view, and I think that's outstanding. I really, really do. Well, if you like the views from here, wait till you get upstairs, because up there is your master bedroom, and this is quite special. There are four bedrooms in total up here. The old part of the property has a characterful double that could make a good guest room and a dual aspect currently being used as a hobby room. On top of this, a landing space has been used as an office. Upstairs in the modern part of the property is a light twin bedroom, a separate stylish shower room and rather spectacular sleeping quarters for them. This is the master suite and there's the view. <laughs> <laughs> now that's a view. There's definitely... I know, you are smiling all over your face. <laughs> <sighs> I am seeing it. I'm just not feeling it. I'm not giving up just yet. Come on, we're going out there. <laughs> yeah. This property comes with half an acre of land. There is also a terraced area at the front of the house designed to enjoy those amazing views. The gardens that wrap around this home give it that real sense of rural seclusion. The sloped lawns are framed by established shrubs and also an impressive area of woodland. Opposite the house is a separate parcel of land. It's made up of raised beds and is currently being used for growing fruit and veg. There's also a state-of-the-art double garage block that could be perfect for James's bike building projects. The property is also surrounded by farmland whose owners might be prepared to lease fields for our couple's yurt camping plans. Now, to be honest, I'm not going to try and sell that land to you as a business. I'm not sure there's really the space to develop your glamping idea. But as an overall package for you as a family, a growing family, I think it is quite interesting. You've got the man cave, a house of two halves. What do you think of it? It definitely gets us thinking. Well, let's keep our eyes on the prize then. How much do you think property number two is worth, madam? 382? 382? Where'd the two come from? Random. Random, I should say so. James? I'm going to go for 375. 375. That's what you said, Lisa, last time, isn't it? This is on the market at £395,000. It's all negotiable. Off you go. Go and explore him, mm. and I'll catch up with you a little bit later. Thank okay. you. Cool. <laughs> Five thousand pounds under budget. I thought this fabulous family home might have the eccentricity and space our couple would appreciate. But it's divided James and Lisa's opinions. It provides a kitchen with all mod cons and the four bedrooms that offer space and seclusion for any foster children. James did see real potential with the land, views, and of course that double garage where he could rev his engines to his heart's content. I really like house number two. The lack of land, it's not necessarily the highest thing on our list. We don't necessarily have to have it as part of the house. So the fact that there's these rolling fields outside, literally right outside the front door, even if the farmers of a mine to rent them out to us, then that's the business taken care of, really. The old and the new mixed for me was too contrasting. I didn't get the sense of it being a family house. I got the sense of it being an adult house. It's designed and it's very thoughtful and clever, but I can't make sense of it. Oh, madam. Hello. How are we then? Good. Still confused. I'm still confused. <laughs> <laughs> Somehow I was expecting that. Don't worry about it. Don't worry about it. Uh, our work today is done. You've got some time this evening to think about everything we have shown you. And then tomorrow morning, guess what happens? My favourite bit. It's the mystery house, yeah. Oh. <laughs> right, come on. It's day two of our property search in Shropshire, and with a maximum budget of £400,000, married couple Lisa and James are ready to move on from their life in Guildford, Surrey, and seek out their dream home in the countryside. Coming up, they'll finally see the mystery house, which I hope would enlighten their property preconceptions. I'm liking this. The kitchen's great. And I visit a very special vessel that's being renovated to its former glory. Right, OK. I'll earn my keep today. <laughs> Thank you. Well, as you can see, our final day of house hunting has dawned bright and sunny. And it is traditional at this point in the show for me to offer you some in-depth analysis as to where our house hunt is going. But on this occasion, with Lisa and with James, to be perfectly honest, 
I don't think I've really got a clue. It's perfectly clear that so far our first two properties haven't pressed every button on their extensive wish list, but then to be honest, I'm not sure that they know which buttons they should press either. So for our mystery house, I'm gonna take a little bit of a gamble. This is a property I don't think they'd have looked at on paper, but if my hunch is right, it might just work. So let's put that theory to the test and make tracks to our mystery proposition. We're heading back to Shropshire, where our destination is the small village of Milson, just a 20 minute drive from Ludlow. Even closer at five miles away is the delightful town of Tenbury Wells. Located on the south bank of the River Team, its high street is lined with a good range of luxury and essential amenities. And when it comes to the mystery option back in Milson, we've managed to find an authentic characterful farm building, but not necessarily in the package our buyers envisaged. There we are at last. Uh, mystery house. What do you make of that? Wow, it's uh, it's very pretty, isn't it? But it is, of course, a converted barn. <laughs> and uh, there was a sense that maybe converted barns weren't for you, so I've taken a bit of a risk on yeah. this one. It doesn't look like a huge, great, echoey barn conversion, yeah. and it looks like it's been very sensitively done. It doesn't look like a barn. As we've gone through this week and our properties, we have tried to help you redefine mm what it is you're looking for. Yeah. The idea of the yurts was always secondary. As we're looking at the properties, we're focusing more on the children, more on the needs. How are we going of... to use the house? Yeah. How's it going to best fit them? Well, this is a really interesting proposition because it's got huge amounts of living space downstairs, but I think also enough space that you can have your degrees of separation should you need it. That's the idea. That's very exciting. That's the hunch I've been working on. <laughs> <laughs> Let's see if I'm right, come on. Go on. The barn was sympathetically renovated into a home in 1987 and is one of four properties in this small development of converted outbuildings. Well, let's start in here with the kitchen. Everybody wants a square kitchen and this is what you've got. <laughs> I'm liking this. The kitchen's great. Isn't this it? is a great. This is exactly the sort of kitchen we were thinking of, yeah, with the table in the middle. And it's very lived in. Yes. Which is what I said, nice and worn around the edges, yeah. lived in, something that we could have a few um, kids around and they could knock the edges and it really wouldn't be a disaster. I really like it. It feels really nice. It also benefits from a laundry room through there. Excellent. Which also leads through to one of the four bedrooms that this property offers you. But in reception areas, this place, I think, spoils you. It's really, really, really good. Come and have a look at this. This is the main sort of living room. We're making our way through the hall, past a convenient downstairs cloakroom and a spacious study with exposed beams to access the reception rooms at the far end of the house. This is the room that I think really helps to sell this property. Is it it's, cuddling you? It's given, yes, and I did say that, didn't I? That I would like, and I do feel that this house has given me a big cuddle, you're right. I'm loving it, I'm loving the fireplace, I'm loving the beams. Yeah. It's huge, there's lots of room for everything to happen. And this isn't it, because through there, we've got you a gorgeous garden room, straight dining room, with a huge table in it, which I think really sets the scene for those family meals that may happen in the future. Come and have a look. Do you see what I mean? Oh, this is a great space, isn't it? Yeah. Really light. The views are gorgeous. Oh, wow. The key thing is, how can we accommodate uh, everybody upstairs? But we're going to really spoil you with a master bedroom. Come and have a look at this. Up on the first floor are three further bedrooms, two are compact doubles with exposed beams that share a tastefully decorated family bathroom. And then there's the main event, the master. He's searching for words. <laughs> It just feels nice. I really feel calm and collected in this house. It's giving me a cuddle as well. <laughs> hey, brilliant. I think we've managed to make an emotional connection here, but this bedroom also delivers practically. There is a huge dressing room with plenty of built-in wardrobe space and a spacious ensuite with walk-in shower. So out of 10 then, how are we doing on our mystery house? So far, it's an eight. Oh, I think it's getting near a nine for me. OK, eight to nine. Let's see if we can bump the numbers up a little bit further. We'll go outside, have a look at the garden. I think the views might get us a ten from yes. you. Quite You're nice a view one. man, aren't you? Definitely. At the back of the property is a garage-come-workshop for James's motors and a pathway that leads to the main garden that has a patio area and around 100 feet of lawn that slopes down at the end creating the effect of infinite vistas over Shropshire's countryside. 
There you go, James. It's not bad, is it, really? It's a <laughs> magnificent view. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely lovely. At the end of this quite narrow, but I think rather private, rather cosy garden. Mm -hmm. Have we gone above a nine? I think the, the view makes it nine and a half, ten. Yeah, there you go. I'm on a nine now. With yes. I'm coming round to the view because it makes him really happy. Yes, you see. So the price then is going to be the final mitigating factor, isn't it? You can come out here with four hundred thousand pounds to play with. Go on then, James. I'm going to go three eight five. Three eight five. Mm -hmm. I would say three nine seven. It's on at three hundred and ninety. Oh. <laughs> Are you happy? Yes, very, very happy. And the primary aim now, the fostering, mm. the house being all important. Yeah. The yurts thing, the holly lets, we can let that gestate a bit, see if there's some land to rent nearby, and maybe do it as a remote business. Go on, off you go. Enjoy <laughs> yourselves. I'll find you as ever a little bit later. Well, there we are. Our mystery house may well have done it again. They have redefined their priorities. That, in my experience, is the key to a successful house hunt. And hopefully now our hunt is over and it's a result. So our mystery property has served its purpose and got them on board with barn conversions. £5,000 under their budget, it got a fantastically positive response. The kitchen got the thumbs up with bags of space for potential foster children and incredible rural views, and it's less than a 20-minute drive from Ludlow. Oh, what a lovely room. Really good size, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah, you know what I like? I like the fact that it's close to the master bedroom so we can keep an eye on the kids. Yeah. This house, to me, means home and family. It's going to be one of the houses that I'm going to be trampling and fighting for. So the next stage for us for this house is to come back and have a visit and see what's um, going on in the local area and uh, see what comes up with those investigations. Ah, how are we? Very good, thank you. Check books at the ready then. <laughs> Who knows? <laughs> now, we have given you all of the options this week. Mm. It's now time for you to go and think about everything we have shown you and see if we can find a solution <laughs> to your future plans. Happy? Yeah, very happy, good. thank you. Come on then. The Ironbridge Gorge World Heritage Site is just a short distance from Blist's Hill, Victorian Town, where an important restoration project is in progress. Curator Georgina Grant and her team have been restoring a unique river vessel that once helped the region thrive. I'm keen to find out more. This is a seven trow, and this is called Spry, and she's about 70 foot long. Seven trows were used as cargo boats in the 18th and 19th centuries and were a fundamental part of the Industrial Revolution's infrastructure before the introduction of trains. Trays were distinctive for two reasons. Firstly, they had deep open holds to maximise the space for freight and goods. And secondly, they had flat hulls in order to navigate parts of the shallow River Severn. How many of them would there have been on the river? Hundreds going up and down the River Severn. We like to say it was something like the M6 of its day. So you've got all these vessels going up and down and trading along the river. Where does the name trow or tro come from? It comes from the name trough and that describes the large open hold in the middle. Different freight loads were carried by troughs, including iron and limestone, but coal was the main cargo. How did they operate? How were they powered? So they, you would have had one captain and about three crewmen, and going downriver they would have sailed down, but coming upriver against the current you would have had gangs of men called bow haulers, and using um, a rope tied to the mast these men would haul the trow up the river. That's a massive job. I mean, this is not a small vessel at all. No, they were very hardy men and uh, not particularly liked, actually. Not particularly liked? Were they a bit rough around the They're edges? A bit, um, a bit like pirates of the day, maybe. <laughs> Keen to get a closer look, we're heading to an elevated gantry to get a better view. Spry was built in 1894 by shipwright William Hurd in Chepstow and would have been at her busiest in the year 1900. That is a gorgeous view, isn't it? It gives us a real idea of the anatomy of this vessel. You get a real sense of her size from up here. It's a great view. So can you give us the vital statistics? She's about 18 foot wide and then would have carried about 56 tonnes. It's thought Spry was one of the last and largest troughs to be built, but she now had to compete with the rise of the railway network and the growth of motor vehicles, which were increasingly phasing out reliance on Britain's waterways. I'd just like to point out to you, this is one of the original timbers here. 
So you have the registration number here and then the registered tonnage, which was 36 tonnes. And there it is, all carved in beautifully, actually. I love it. I mean, how big a story is this in terms of Shropshire? I mean, when people talk about yes, the Trow, well, it has a real resonance, doesn't it? Yeah, it's got a lovely history. Um, when she was brought to Bliss Hill, um, we sent out a request for trees to be donated to help build her. And in the end, we had 83 trees donated. So she really is a kind of Shropshire gem. People know about this vessel. And they love to come and see her. As they have their own connection with her now. After her heyday in the early 1900s, Spry fell into a dilapidated state. But the team here has spent the last six years getting her ship shape once again. Right, OK. I'll earn my keep today. Well, George, thank you very much for a very exclusive look around this wonderful boat. Um, but my goodness me, you've got plenty to do. I'll give you a hand. Thank you. <laughs> It's wonderful that the museum and residents of Shropshire have come together to restore Spry, a workhorse of the Industrial Revolution and an important piece of the county's heritage. Well, as you've probably gathered, Lisa and James have not only challenged me this week, but also themselves. So have we managed to find a solution to their newfound dream of a life in the countryside? Well, let's go and ask them. The weather in Shropshire is rubbish, isn't it? <laughs> Why would anybody want to live here? Well, guys, how's it been this week? We've really had our eyes open as to what's out here, what can we got for the money, and what we're looking for, really. Ah, now then, this is the nub of it, isn't it? What are you looking for? A functional space, somewhere that I can have a vision of what it would be like to run the household and have my family around me and how that would work. That's what I'm looking for. That's the core thing that's come out of this week for me. Well, we gave you three properties to choose from. Has any one of them become the thing that you think you are looking for? Yeah, the mystery house. <laughs> <laughs> the mystery house. What was it about the mystery house that really worked for you? Well, for a barn conversion, it was really great. It looked like a, a country farmhouse, so the aesthetics were really pleasing to me. The Mystery House enabled me to visualise having a family there, what it would be like on a day-to-day -day basis, how the house would work, and clarified some things I just hadn't thought about, like having the bedrooms close by to the master bedroom and having a nice big square kitchen and a workshop for James. So I could really see what it would be like to live there. So why aren't you buying it? We need to do some more research around the location. We're not so um, familiar with the location. I think that's the next step for us before we go running off in any direction is to find out what's around there. I hope whatever you buy, it is exactly what you want it to be to fit the new life and the future that you can envisage for yourselves and those children that you're going to take on. Thank you so much. Best thank of luck. You. Absolutely, thank you. Thank you. Well, it has been said many times before on this show, knowing what you're after really is half the battle in any successful house hunt. That is a lesson that James and Lisa have most definitely learned. But in fairness to them, that was part of the challenge that they gave us, trying to figure out what it is they are after. Well, their search will continue out there across Shropshire and possibly over the border into Wales. But one thing they have remained true to is their wish to foster children in need, to give youngsters a better chance for the future. And in that, we all wish them the very best of luck. I'll see you next time. If you'd like to escape to the country in England, Scotland, Wales or Northern Ireland and would like our help, then please apply online at bbc.co.uk forward slash be on a show. Having spent much of his adult life abroad, today's buyer, who's house hunting with his brother, hopes to find a country pad he can finally call home. And when it comes to the niceties of property shopping, we're all in agreement. Oh, this is nice, isn't it? Oh, nice and bright. Oh, this is nice, isn't it? Nice and bright, isn't it? Nice and light. Oh, this is nice, isn't it? It is. Decent-sized garden, isn't it? Today, I'm in Oxfordshire at the Woodstock Manor House, whose views were described as the finest in England by Lady Randolph Churchill, mother of Sir Winston, who was born here on the Blenheim Palace estate. Now, the Manor House has a lease, which is currently up for renewal, free of charge, but with one caveat. The property requires three million pounds worth of refurbishment, and whoever takes the lease on must commit to those works. But whoever does will be guaranteed splendid views of the Oxfordshire countryside for at least 20 years. 
Situated in southern England, landlocked Oxfordshire is bordered by six counties, including Gloucestershire, Wiltshire and Berkshire. In the south of the county, the chalky Chiltern Hills reign supreme as an area of outstanding natural beauty, covering some 300 square miles and home to the once endangered Red Kite. The county's capital is Oxford, the city of dreaming spires, a phrase coined by the 19th century poet Matthew Arnold to describe the architecture of the university buildings, many of which are around 700 years old. Just outside the city, the honey-coloured market town of Woodstock is popular with tourists who visit the nearby splendour of Blenheim Palace. Pretty Oxfordshire villages include Islip, which was the birthplace of Anglo-Saxon King Edward the Confessor, and whose death in 1066 sparked the infamous battle to succeed him at Hastings. With its city of culture, classic English countryside and eye-catching rural architecture, Oxfordshire is a county with something for everyone. Oxfordshire's prime central location, attractive property stock and excellent transport links into London have pushed the average price for a detached property here up to an eye-watering £446,000. That's around 50% above the national figure. But that's not to say the county is solely for those with money to burn. There are more affordable areas if you know where to look for them, such as the countryside around the towns of Banbury and Bicester, which are perhaps unsurprisingly located towards the north of the county, further away from London. So what's attracting today's buyer to this beautiful county? Let's meet him and find out. Today's buyer is Phil, who has asked his older and slightly taller brother Rob to join him on his house hunt. After spending much of his adult working life abroad, home is currently a rented apartment in Chinham, a suburb of Basingstoke in Hampshire. Living in Chinham has been OK, but it's not where I wanted to end up. And I think where I am presently, living in an apartment, and like with all apartments, you're on large, modern developments. You know, I don't want that sort of lifestyle. I, want, I was brought up in a village-type atmosphere, and I'm now thinking that I'd like to get back to that. Phil is originally from South Wales, and until he retired, he worked in the telecoms industry, spending long periods living in both the Middle East and Southeast Asia, before finally returning to the UK two years ago. I've travelled quite a lot. Uh, I've lived out of a suitcase for quite a bit uh, and lived in other people's homes. Uh, and uh, <laughs> even, even, even Rob's. Yes. You know, well, you know. Yeah. well somebody's got to do the cleaning, as they say. <laughs> so, uh, we try not to give him our address, but he always found yeah, us. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I to, think it was the food, wasn't it? It was, it was the food. Cooking. It was the food. Yeah. It wasn't the free drink, I know that. <laughs> With his brother Rob living in nearby Milton Keynes, a son moving to Bedfordshire in the near future, and a daughter in North Wales, the self-confessed globetrotter is hoping to settle down within easy reach of all of his relatives. It's time to think about the next 10, 15, 20 years of my life and where I want to be and where my friends will be and where my family is going to be. And the Oxfordshire countryside should also appeal to Phil's interests and hobbies. I am toying with the idea of, of buying a classic car. Obviously, I need to have a double garage for that. I play a lot of golf, some great golf courses around there. Now, there's something sadly lacking in, uh, in Philip's golf, and yeah, that's talent. <laughs> talent. Sadly lacking. When it comes to choosing the perfect property, they'll put any brotherly competition aside, for two minds are better than one. I think because we, although we're brothers, we still look at things slightly differently, mm. don't we? Well, I think I'm more of a practical type person, I think. I think I'm going to be a bonus, an added bonus, anyway, going to be there. Yes. And he's free. But as well as being on hand to offer advice, Rob is convinced that his brother is making the right decision to finally put down roots in the Oxfordshire countryside. He will be moving into an area which is unknown. So he will have to start again to make new friends. Phil is a very friendly chap. He, he makes friends very, very easily. He can join in. He wants to do things. So I think it is a big move for Phil, but I think it's not a move that he'll be afraid of, and I think he'll uh, do it very, very successfully, actually. Phil would like to be within a 45-minute drive of his brother Rob in Milton Keynes, so we're concentrating our property search in the northern half of the county. 
I'm meeting up with them in Oxfordshire to hone in on Phil's property wish list. So we're meeting by a babbling brook. You got the message? Yes. Beautiful yes. here, isn't it? Beautiful. Lovely. Absolutely. Beautiful. Absolutely beautiful. Absolutely gorgeous. So Rob, as his brother, how long has he been harping on about this move to the countryside? He's been harping on for many years. <laughs> for <laughs> many, true. many he's, years. He's consistent. Yes. So I wish that you'd hurry up and find him somewhere. <laughs> so how long have you been looking? Uh, probably in earnest two years now since I came back from overseas. What exactly do you think you're looking for then, Phil? I like uh, modern living, but I like to be in a, a house that's got some sort of character. Okay. Um, light, airy, three bedrooms. Right. Three uh, bedrooms, uh, right. Double garage, preferably. Double garage, right. Because yeah, you can put all your junk in there, you know. So and he's I've got, got a, a lot of junk. <laughs> I have a lot of junk. So. Decent sized house. Yep. Garden. You've got a bit of time on your hands, haven't you? Yeah. And I like a bit of gardening. I like to do a bit of physical uh, work. So what sort of gardening? Growing veg? I haven't in the past, but I wouldn't mind having a doing a little bit. The village. How big a village would you like it to be? Something, I always think about a village of 600 to 1,000 people. But, you know, it doesn't need to be that. I think he wants to have neighbours, because Phil's quite a friendly, sociable fella. So, uh, you know, if there's something happening in the, in the village itself, Phil will take part in it. Yeah. Right. You know, things like Amdram, although he's never done that, but all dancing, because he's learning ballroom dancing, aren't you, Phil? Yeah. Oh, yeah. You know, yeah. things like that. Twinkle so toes. Take... <laughs> yeah, I don't know yeah. about that. You should see me dance. <laughs> <laughs> Claude Hoppers. <laughs> uh, Claude Hoppers. <laughs> yeah. You know? Yeah. yeah, the community <laughs> spirit, that's what I'm looking for. Well, it sounds like that's what you're after, which is, which is brilliant. Let's talk price, Phil. Uh-huh. What's the budget? Uh, the budget is about £675,000, uh, which I think is a fair budget for what I want. Yeah. Well, after looking for a couple of years, I think you've got a good idea generally of what you want. These next couple of days are more about the specifics, what works for you and what doesn't. That is very true. I think it's going to be a great challenge for you guys to find me a place, and I'm really looking forward to it. I think we're both looking forward to it. And I hope you do find something for him, because we can go on to a different subject after two years of boring us about it. <laughs> I'll is, do my best. Come on, Aidan. <laughs> okay. He's been boring you, has he? Yes, absolutely. <laughs> with a budget of £675,000, our buyer would like a house of character with a modern and light feel inside. It must have three bedrooms to accommodate visiting family and a double garage to store all the belongings he's collected on his travels, along with the planned classic car. The garden should be of a decent size with room for a vegetable patch and he'd like to live within a village community. We've lined up an appealing selection of Oxfordshire homes for Phil and Rob to investigate, but I won't be revealing the price details until the end of each house tour. Our final offering, the mystery house, could challenge Phil to streamline his collectibles. Our first house is in the village of Kirtlington, six miles north of Oxford. A small village with a population of just under 1,000, many of the older buildings are constructed using the golden-coloured limestone commonly found throughout the area. Amenities include a post office with convenience store, a gastropub and a 13th century church. More importantly for Phil, there's an 18-hole golf course with driving range to help him improve his swing. And hopefully property number one will come up to par as it's located on the edge of the popular village. Option number one. Here we go. What do we think? Yeah. Well, outwardly, it looks quite nice, actually. Nice and modern, nice light, plenty of windows. It was completed in 2010. Right. right. Now, what do you think of this edge of village location for your brother here, Rob? I think it's ideal. It's uh, not far from local shops, a post office and the pub. Most importantly. Yeah, quick uh, walk within five minutes. Yeah. Half mm. hour back from the pub, though. <laughs> <laughs> Crawl back. <laughs> Crawl back. Now, this is south-facing. I think you get the best first impressions from yeah, here. Right. But your everyday entrance would be round the back up its own drive. All right. This house so. tries to make the most of the sun both ways. Yeah. Let's go inside. Beams. OK. Although the location seems to suit Phil, I don't seem to be getting an overwhelming first reaction to the property itself. But at just five years old, I'm hoping the modern interior will appeal to his taste. In we come, gentlemen. You told me, Phil, you liked open plan and light and space. Yeah. If you come stand right in here, All right. you get an idea of what's what and where's where. Yeah, it looks nice, actually. Nice out, as you said, it's open. Nice size. 
It's, uh, it's light and airy. Yeah, well, which is exactly what you said you wanted. Yeah, it does flow very well, actually. And yeah. certainly in the kitchen. Let me show you. OK. So, open plan. Overall, very nice. I like the high ceilings. I like the featured windows. Uh, it's a nice size kitchen, not too big. Oh, well, yeah. Lots of light. I'd like to try uh, the tap. Is try the tap? Yes. I like to see that these things work. Oh, yeah. Okay. Water works, Phil. <laughs> I'm, there just, you go. I'm just worried, Rob. How are you going to clean those windows for me? Are you um, happy with those taps now? I'm quite happy with those taps. Well, I know they work because otherwise, what would Phil do? Yeah, I know. Well, I'm, I'm telling you, you're coming over to my place to wash his dishes. <laughs> That's true. It's a good job you're here, Rob. You know, no, I, I have my that. uses. <laughs> well, Rob did say he was practical, and I'm sure the water pressure's equally as strong in the utility room, which lies just off the kitchen. The ground floor also features a generous study room. Upstairs, there are two large bedrooms, both in the eaves and one with dormer windows overlooking the front and rear gardens. Both rooms make use of the family bathroom. But the master is back downstairs on the ground floor. The current owner uses this bedroom as his master because it's actually the biggest room, biggest bedroom rather, and, mm -hmm. oh, she's got an en suite. It's not huge, but it, it's OK. You don't sound like you're jumping for joy in it, um, I'd say. I would expect for the master bedroom to be a little bit bigger and probably have a bit more areas for storage. It's, it's OK, but it's not a wow. Let's go outside, look yep. at the okay. garden there, yes. and start getting your head around how much this house might be for sale. OK, right. look right. forward to it. Okay. Yeah. So the size of the master has let the side down a little, even though Phil has two further bedrooms to choose from upstairs. Outside, the tidy lawn garden extends to the rear and is bordered on one side by mature trees. Although there's no vegetable patch here at the moment, Phil could utilise the village allotment, which borders the front of the property, although there is a waiting list. OK, then. So this is the north-facing garden. What's missing right. from this equation? Garage. Garage. Yeah, but you can see where you want to put it. I mean. The owners had conversations with the planning officer and they said, in principle, they'd have no objection, but you would have to make formal inquiries. Right. Your own. Nice-sized garden. De definitely sort of the garden size that I'm looking for. Is it? OK. Yeah. Put some runner beans along the fence. There you go. Mm. You yeah, know. So, guess yeah. the price. Well, I'm going to say 649. I think it's lower than that. I think it's about 600,000. Rob, he's on the money. This place on the market for £600,000. Yes! <laughs> <laughs> go back into the house, have a good yeah. look around, and then I'll catch you later on. OK. OK. All right. Off you go. Go right in. Under budget by £75,000, our first property, a modern chalet-style house, offers Phil the contemporary interior he wanted, along with three bedrooms and a manageable garden. Situated on the edge of a popular village, it gives Phil a community on his doorstep. And although the property lacks a double garage at the moment, there's money left over to build one, subject to planning permission. My initial reaction was, what a lovely setting this was. Certainly, looking at the outside of the house, it, it looked nice. It was nice and clean lines. It was, you know, well maintained. When I first saw the property, I thought it was a little small. As Johnny brought us into the property, I felt that it was nice, light and airy. As far as the character is concerned, I don't think it uh, matched Phil's expectations. So, all done inside? Yep. 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 Good start. All really done. is. Good start, but it sounds like could do better. Not there. Not, not there. there yet. No, it's not right for him, I don't think. He's not happy with it. Well, yeah. onward and upward then. Follow me. OK. On we go. In the heart of the county lies the city of Oxford, a university town but also an economic hub for the surrounding countryside, relying on its transport network to ferry people in and out of the busy city. Typically, the student's staple is the handy bicycle, whilst for other residents, the bus remains a favoured form of transit. In 1967, a group of enthusiasts established a syndicate to preserve the city's buses for future generations. And today, the Oxford Bus Museum, just outside Woodstock, houses a classic collection of vehicles with over 30 models on display. 
Since Phil is interested in vintage automobiles, we sent him and Rob to meet museum trustee Chris Butterfield. Pleased to meet you. Welcome to the museum. Here we're in one of the principal exhibition halls. Behind us there is an example of a 1913 bus because in 1913 the very first buses came to Oxford. The first bus in Oxford uh, followed straight on from horse trams. Oxford was rather unusual in not having any electric trams. So in 1913, when most cities had electric trams, Oxford still had the horse. And some people were really sick of it. So William Morris, the man who made, built the cars in Oxford, he actually operated the very first buses in Oxford. And what we see here is typical of the bus. Seating a mere 36 people and limited to a speed of just 12 miles per hour, the first motorised buses to hit Oxford were still a big improvement on the horse-drawn tram and made commuting a lot easier. So, Chris, what was the cost of a typical fare at that time? Uh, well, a penny or two pence. Uh, old money, of course, not new money. Yes. There's a song called uh, Polly Perkins of Paddington Green that you might remember here. Uh, before my time, maybe. Perhaps before maybe your rocks. time, but it does end up with somebody who loses the love of his life uh, who goes off with a bow-legged conductor of a tuppenny bus. So that was a tuppenny fare oh, on that right. particular bus. So a penny, two pence was quite typical. All oh, right. Over the decades that followed, the shape and size of buses changed dramatically. One of the biggest advances was in engine design, which had a positive impact on passenger comfort and saved the bus companies some money as well. Well, here we're in one of the running sheds, which is where we keep the running members of the fleet. We've got two single-decker buses here, which illustrate between them very well the development of the bus between the 1950s and the 1960s. What has happened over those few years is they've taken the engine from the front of the bus. We can see it standing there vertically at the front. They've turned it sideways, horizontally, and put it underneath the floor of the bus, a little bit further back. And that means that the passengers can now get on at the front and pay the driver as they do so. You've saved the conductor's wages and we're getting towards the kind of bus that we know nowadays. Eventually, engines were moved right to the back of the bus, allowing even easier passenger access to the front, the low-floor double-decker being the most recognisable design today. But we're staying in the 1960s with one of the last front-engine models, an AEC Renown. Phil has been offered a chance to take the wheel. He fires up the 9.6-litre diesel engine. Start switch on. And start. Okay. Sounds nice. It's all right, is it? Okay. Steady. Rich and throaty, they say. <laughs> all right then, Phil. Right. Shall we go on? Yes, as long as you got your tickets. You we have tickets. our tickets. Shall we get on board? We'll get on board. Come on, then. 30 feet in length and weighing seven tons, it's thought there are only 20 of these vehicles still in existence. All right, well, here we are. You can ring the bell. You can go. It's just a short drive along the museum's forecourt, but Phil has got the hang of it. So it's time we put our foot down to find him the home of his dreams. For our second offering, we're travelling north to the village of Upper Hayford, about six miles northwest of Bicester, and around a 45-minute drive from Rob in Milton Keynes. The village's mix of architecture includes a long row of Cotswold stone cottages covered by one continuous thatched roof. Amenities include a public house and a former Victorian reading room, restored by the community and now used by local clubs and societies. Running through Upper Hayford is the Oxford Canal, which opened in the late 18th century to ship coal from the Coventry coal fields to Oxford, where it connects with the River Thames. The village is surrounded by farmland, a mixture of arable and livestock. House number two is located in the heart of this sought-after village. Now then, the second offering is a bit older. See that? By a couple of hundred years. This is late 18th century. So you feel a bit more like you're in the heart of the village. Nice rural setting. Yeah. Looks really nice. It does actually, yes. I'm really keen to look inside and see what it's got going for it. Good. Well, that's why we're here. Let's go have a look. Okay. okay. Built of Cotswold stone, the present owners have completely renovated this end-of-terrace three-storey property, and it combines characterful charm with modern conveniences. The house greets you with this part panel dining room, but backing onto that is a modern extension. Ah, oh. loads of space, loads of options. I want us first to settle in this room. 
So I think we'll like it. Oh, very nice. Oh, this is nice, isn't it? Oh, absolutely. It's a nice size room, isn't nice it? Nice and bright. It's one of those relaxing places. You can get just get your newspaper, sit down here and just chill out. And spend hours reading his paper. Well, no, this is completely different to your first reactions mm. in the first property. Yes. Automatically, you're saying, oh, I can see myself sitting here doing what you love. But I want you to see this room first because I think this is a really nice partner with the main living room. Let me show you. Right. right. OK. So what do you think about this room, then? Oh, this is nice. Oh, this is lovely, oh, isn't lovely it? Oh, lovely fireplace as well. Yes, Inglenook-type fireplace, isn't yeah. it? So tell me, Rob. Yes? Have you seen your brother react like this to many houses before? No. I think he quite likes this one. The thing is, this is not a detached house, but it's of a size, yeah. you know, and it, it feels warm, actually. Mm. You know, it feels comfortable yeah. and cosy. And of an age where the walls will be quite thick anyway... Yeah. Look at the reveal of, of that window. Uh, that's the right. depth yeah. of those walls. So you're thinking of your neighbours, yeah. if they have the same thickness. Well, I don't think there'll be neighbours quite as thick as you two, but it'll well, be... Well, um... you never know. <laughs> that's coming from yeah. me. The thickest of them all. <laughs> That's true. Mm. Let's go to the kitchen. Right. Okay. Little kitchen. More work been done in here. Oh, oh this right. is nice, isn't it? It's nice and bright, isn't it? Yeah. Yes. I like the uh, centre. Piece. Very nice. Right. May I try yeah. the taps? <laughs> yeah, go on. I can try the taps, can I? Try the taps. It's all part right. of this okay. viewing process. Okie cokey. Yeah, good flow on that. Taps are okay, Phil. Yeah, I like the uh, I like the modern basin. You know, the dual. Well. well, I must say, from where I'm stood, so far so good. I think so. It's really good. It's I really like this house. Good. Upstairs next. So a big thumbs up from both Phil and Rob to the ground floor layout and finish. Upstairs there are four bedrooms spread over two floors. Up on the second floor, nestled in the eaves, are two smaller bedrooms with skylight windows, although one is presently used as a study. Then on the first floor are two larger bedrooms, including a guest double with built-in wardrobes, and there's a fully tiled family bathroom, which just leaves the master suite. Now this master bedroom has a small walk-in wardrobe through that door and then an ensuite as well. Oh, OK. This is a nice sized room. It is a nice size room, it's isn't it? Plenty of space here. Yeah. This is perfect. A nice chair, you can sit there. Yes. Read your paper. Read the paper. Read the paper. Yeah. That's right. Yeah, look. <laughs> Rob, are we looking potentially at a future new home? Uh, uh, for my brother? Yeah. Uh, yes. <laughs> well, now what you've got to do is try and price it. OK. OK. Start yes. thinking. You're one nil down. I know I'm we one nil. thinking. With the interior scoring highly, let's hope the garden is on target. It extends to the rear and is mainly lawn. Fully enclosed and secluded, there's also a paved patio area, handy for entertaining. Well, this is nice, isn't it? It is. Decent-sized garden, isn't it? It's yeah. lovely, isn't it? Really nice. Just... Yes. Just the right size. And then you've got a garage, which is one of three, and then there's some planning consent to build a new garage if you want just beyond it. OK. So, Rob, would you like to see your brother living in this house? It's a bit close to where I live, but <laughs> yes, OK. A la cuisse. There you go. Well, that's a good, good start, isn't it? It's All not right, bad. Then. Let's guess the price. Now, I think it's slightly above the price that he asked originally, so I'm going for 680. OK. I'll say 665. This house... Believe it or not, it's on the market for offers around £625,000. Oh, gosh. That's pretty good. That is. Isn't good. it? That is. Yes. That's well below my budget and gives me a bit of money to. Uh, Spend on the person to help me find it. Do it. Well, I wouldn't say that. I would. <laughs> but, uh, I thought it was more expensive. And I was being kind to let my brother win. <laughs> Calling well, that's very wants. kind of you to do that. Well, it's one all, so well done. I think so. Okay. Go back Let's inside, fellas. I'll we'll see you later on. Oh, Thank okay. you. Okay, see you later. Well, they said themselves, pleasantly surprised, under budget. What's not to like? Leaving Phil £50,000 to spare, our second option is a Cotswold stone cottage dating back to the late 1700s. With a modern interior making use of some striking original features, it offers Phil character with a contemporary feel. 
It comes with one more bedroom than he asked for and a manageable garden. There's already a single garage with options to build a second, and the house is situated in the centre of a popular village. Oh, so it's nice, isn't it, Phil? Yeah, it's not bad. It's a nice, uh, bit limited uh, height, but they're getting them short anyway. Yeah. Nice views over the country as well. Yeah, I think it's... Uh, can't fault it. The inside of this house was really good. It's modern, very fashionable. It has all the bits that I was looking for in a house. You could move into it straight away. When we arrived outside the house, I must admit, my first thoughts, I was a little disappointed um, because I was expecting to see a drive, uh, maybe a front and what have you. But once we walked through the front door, it was just light, airy, well decorated. I was surprised. This house clearly fits the bill that Philip is looking for. And I think that he would you know, enjoy being in this home. Happy? Very it's happy. Seen enough of this quite large house? Yes, I think it's nice. It ticks all the boxes, I think. It says, I do what Phil is looking for. But it's more than that, isn't it? It's more than just ticking boxes. It's what you feel about a house. So tonight, your homework is this. A couple of points and discuss this as a potential new home. How's that sound? That sounds good. Let's sounds go do it. great. It's the second day of our property search with Phil from Basingstoke in Hampshire and his brother Rob. With a £675,000 budget, he's looking to put down roots in the Oxfordshire countryside after many years working abroad. Coming up, Rob's thinking practically again. You can get round with a vacuum cleaner pretty quick in here, Phil. Mm. And you feather duster. And feather duster. <laughs> and it's all aboard as I discover how the Victorians used to unwind. After showing both Phil and Rob around those properties yesterday, I'm starting to realise that maybe Phil hasn't found the right house after looking for two years because he's looked at properties through a tick list formula rather than properties that might take his breath away. And that's what the mystery house is all about. It'll give Phil the two most important things, light open spaces inside and that quirky character. But the property itself, it comes in a package that he hasn't necessarily asked for, but we think he might rather like. Let's see how we go. So far, I mean, you've looked for so long now, a couple of years. Yep. And you haven't defined a specific type of house, have you? No, and, and there's a reason for that, because I think if you get too definitive, then it limits your search patterns perhaps too much. You keep your sights so wide, one day you're going to have to make a decision, aren't you? That is true. For our mystery property, we're heading into southern Oxfordshire to the village of Kingston Blount, right next door to the Buckinghamshire border. A mile down the road is the larger village of Chinner, which is a range of amenities and an old post mill. It has recently been rebuilt by the local community after the original mill was bulldozed in the 1960s to make way for housing. Chinner is also home to a heritage railway line which runs historic diesel and steam engines to Tame around three miles away. Our mystery house is in the centre of Kingston Blount, a smaller village with its own pub and ideally located for transport links between London and Oxford. Part of a complex of six properties, the Mystery House gives Phil the character and community he wanted, but will challenge him to give up some of his keepsakes, as the storage space is somewhat limited. It's a barn conversion, but what do we think? Nice development here, isn't it? You like it, do you? It's quite mature, yeah. Yeah. Converted 17 years ago, the property, the barn, dates back 1794. Right. And it would have been a grain barn. See that old funnel there, look? Yeah. That yeah. would have aired the grain inside the barn, and this barn would have serviced that lovely manor house, or farmhouse, rather, next door. Right. I can see there's quite a lot of parking. Is there a garage? That is one of the compromises of the mystery house. There is no garage. There is a farm just, just up the road, and you can rent some space there, but there's no garage to speak of. You just had to keep your tractor in, Phil? <laughs> Yeah, that would be it. Get into the country uh, spirit. Yeah. Is that, you know, is that a... Would that put you off a house without a garage? It doesn't help the situation, I must admit. But having said that, let's go and see what's inside. Come on, then. Come on.
A measured response to our mystery barn conversion. Clearly, the lack of an on-site garage is a concern. But I'm hoping Phil keeps an open mind as we explore the property. Righty-ho. So, Phil, you're in here first. <laughs> Hit me with it. What do you think? Well, it's a nice size. It's uh, nice and light. So far, so good. It's, an, it's a nice entertaining room, this, isn't it? Easy to upkeep so, as well. Spotlight. Yeah. You can what? get round with a vacuum cleaner pretty quick in here, Phil. Hmm. Yeah, it's a... Uh, and your feather duster. And the feather duster. <laughs> I don't, I don't <laughs> even want to go there. Come <laughs> on, into the kitchen. Come on. Let's think of something else, though. Come on. Aside from this large 24-foot living room, there are only two other rooms on this ground floor. A utility and washroom, as well as the kitchen. So what do we think of this kitchen? Nice size, good aspect with the windows. It is a nice size, isn't it? It's adequate. So uh, what aren't you seeing in this house that you'd like to see or that you might have seen before then? I'd probably like to have seen one more room downstairs, I think. Mm. Yeah. But, mm. I mean, it doesn't say it's, it's... Well, let's go and see the rest of the house. Yeah, keep an open mind and see yeah. what uh, the rest of the house And as, like. as we've said, it's, it's all about compromise. And, you know, you can't have... It well, like... is it? You say the words, oh, it's all about compromise. Will you be able to make the compromise for the right house? I don't think you want to compromise, which is fair enough. If you're paying a certain amount of money, you would like to try to get this close to what fits the bill. I'm feeling we've almost got a bit flat downstairs. Let's see if upstairs impresses you more. Come on, OK. Mate. On this occasion, the Mystery House kitchen didn't even warrant Rob's tap test. So I'm feeling the pressure as we head upstairs. The first floor is divided up into four decent-sized bedrooms. All benefiting from high ceilings, there are two singles at one end of the barn, as well as a light, spacious guest double, and a shower room that services this level. This is your master. What do we think? Right. On suite next door, as you can see. Well, this is a nice room, isn't it? It is, isn't it? Yes. Yeah, I like the high ceiling, and it's, it's good space. Storage probably could be a little bit more. I think one of the stumbling blocks is the garage, lack of garage. There is, because it's surprising how much stuff you accumulate over time, and I've certainly got some, and uh, I know I've got to get rid of a lot. Uh, but it does look to be a, a bit of a lack of outside storage. That's fair yeah. enough. Let's go outside and start thinking about price, OK? OK. Despite giving him that practical character he was looking for, the mystery barn conversion isn't striking a chord with Phil or Rob, for that matter. So it's back outside to check out the garden, which is laid to the front and essentially hard landscaped with raised timber decking, making it as low maintenance as possible. What do you think of the house overall? It hasn't got the wow factor. No, and that's, that's something you have been consistent on, isn't it? I don't think it suits Phil. OK, then let's guess the price. Who's going first? Phil will go first. I oh. think so, yes. Uh, I think... It's about 575,000. All right. Rob? Hi, it's Phil. I think it'll be 565,000. OK. Phil, you win. This house is on the market for off around £635,000. Never. It's a good part of the world. You're paying for the location here, gents. If it was cheaper, if you could get it cheaper, would it be worth making any changes to this to make it right for you? This is the time to find out. Go back inside and have a good look around. OK. okay. Thank See you, you in a moment. Under budget by £40,000, the mystery barn conversion is the most expensive option we've shown Phil and Rob. With an open plan layout downstairs and four bedrooms upstairs, it gives Phil the modern interior he wanted. But he'd have to store his memorabilia elsewhere in the village. And the property is ideally located for access to both Oxford and London. When we came inside, initially I thought it was about the right size, but uh, I would probably like to have seen another room, a separate room, uh, added on to give that sort of just another dimension to, to the house. As far as the garage is concerned, I think it is a deal breaker. I think he would like the garage to be on site so easily accessible because he can keep his tools in there or workings or whatever, keep his golf clubs and things like that. So, yes, I think that is a deal breaker. So, all done inside here? I think so. Yeah. yeah. Well, no more houses, I'm afraid, but it's now time for you guys to sit down, have a conflab, 
of a polite argument, and I'll catch up with you after that. How's that? Look forward to it. Come on. Sounds good. Carving its way through the southern half of the county, the River Thames is one of the country's much-loved waterways. The inspiration for classic tales such as The Wind in the Willows and Three Men in a Boat, its 215-mile course passes through some beautiful countryside, as well as the city of Oxford. With the rise of tourism in the 19th century, the Thames became a popular destination for Victorian day-trippers, and canny boat builders turned their attention to the growing leisure industry. One such firm is Salters, based at Folly Bridge in Oxford, a family-run business that's been operating pleasure cruises on the Thames for the last 150 years. I've come to meet fifth and sixth generation father and son, John and Paul Salter. Ahoy, gentlemen. How are we? Very well, thank you. Very well, thank you. How are you doing? Now, I understand this is a... It's an old business. So how long has this been in family hands? Uh, we started in 1858 as boat builders over on the other side of the river there. Oh, right, OK. Um, and and we... what sort of boats were you building then, John? Boats for the colleges, mostly. Racing eights, fours, sculling boats. Right. And then we progressed to doing sort of heavier boat building, sort of punts and rowing boats and that sort of thing. Now, pleasure boating, this really took off in just, Victorian times. Just at the turn of the century. We, our first boat was a boat called Alaska. Yeah. And we started the Oxford to Abingdon services then. We forged associations with the British Railways, as they were then, and we had, they'd bring trainloads of, of, of visitors on day trips from Wales and all over the country. And uh, we used to take them for a day trip, and then they'd be sent home again. And of course, there wasn't a lot for people to do. There were no theme parks. So a, a boat ride was quite very, well, very special now. Yeah. But it's, it was even more special in those days. Built in 1913, the Wargrave was originally steam-operated and converted to diesel power in the 1940s. At 84 and a half feet long, it can accommodate almost 200 passengers. During her 100-year-long life, the vessel has entertained esteemed guests, including King George V, who came on board when he opened the Royal Albert Dock Extension in 1921. Today we have the boat to ourselves, and as we cut through Christchurch Meadow on our way downstream, I'm getting a lesson in pleasure boat skippering and river etiquette from 25-year-old son Paul, who's soon to take over the running of the business from his dad. Talk me through it then. All right then, so you've got the steering wheel here, got the throttle cable just here, which is just behind you. Um, if you'd like to keep that in forward. Um, now, which side of the river should I go on? Um, if you stick to the right-hand side of the river, um, but just off central, uh, if we make sure we don't go too close to the bank, just because it gets quite shallow. Automatically, I'm seeing there's a lot of traffic. Yeah, it's, it's a very, very busy stretch of the river. Um, right. There's quite a lot to look out for. Um, there's a lot of um, boaters um, which are moored up, which have got people uh, living on. Um, you've got the um, rowing eights as well, coming up and down with the canoes. So, what's the speed limit? Uh, eight knots. Eight knots. So, the future of this family business, six generations on, lies with your son here. It oh, certainly yeah. does. Feeling the pressure? Uh, not really at the moment. Not all well. at the moment. <laughs> oh, that's good. <laughs> good you're preparing yourself for the unexpected. Look, yeah. it's, it's a great tradition, and it's great to see it's still in rude health. I wish you the best of luck for the future. Thank, Thank you very much. much. Thank you. With a number of heritage pleasure boating companies operating along the Thames, it's clear that messing about on the river remains a popular way to unwind, not least after some serious house hunting. Well, it's pretty clear to me that with Rob's counsel, if you like, Phil favours house number two. But has it done enough to call to an end Phil's two-year hunt for the right property? Let's find out. Now then, gents, you're not falling out, have you? Absolutely not. So? Still brothers. Still brothers. <laughs> You'll always be brothers. <laughs> You've got a favourite house? House number two? That's true. What's next? Well, I think uh, what's next for me is to go back again, uh, have another view, get a better understanding of the garage, what's there, what planning has been approved, and then, you know, talk to the estate agents and, and just see, you know, a bit, a bit more about the history of the house. How about from your point of view, Rob? Is that, it, do you think that house is suitable? I think it is suitable. It's got a wonderful sunroom. Mm. You can spend most of the time in there. 
Yeah, it's a nice relaxing area. Yeah. It's like for me, but if I get visitors or something, you can go in the, into mm. the other main lounge. Of course, after looking for property for a couple of years now, you're going to find it hard to finally pull the trigger. Yes, I am. Um, but these opportunities don't come very often, and I think I need to move very quickly on it. I am one for procrastination of decision making, which frustrates others uh, and myself. Mm. And now I think I've really got to think about this more quickly and come to a decision. Well, look, it sounds like we're, we're on the road, aren't we? What do you think, Rob? I think so. At long last, after two very, very long years. <laughs> but it's an ideal location for him. It's, as we were saying, 30 miles from where I live. Do me one favour, won't you? Let me know how you get on at this house. Yes, I will do. I certainly will. And I really appreciate the work that you've done, Johnny, on our behalf. And uh, I look forward to keeping in touch with you and letting you know the outcome. Do so, please. Thank you very much. Thanks. Thank you. I've got to say, I've had a lot of fun showing Phil and Rob around these three houses. And it's great news that Phil wants to go back to house number two for a second viewing. But is he finally ready to commit to a purchase after all this time looking for a house? Well, I hope so. I bet his brother Rob does too. See you next time. If you'd like to escape to the country in either England, Wales, Northern Ireland or Scotland and need our help, please apply online at bbc.co.uk 